Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Dr. Mark Gaffney. Dr. Gaffney is a visionary thinker, social activist, and passionate philosopher. He is known for his source code teachings, including unique self theory, the five selves, the amorous cosmos, a politics of evolutionary love, a return to eros, and digital intimacy. He is the author of over 25 books, holds a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University, as well as orthodox rabbinic ordination. He teaches on the cutting edge of philosophy and spirit in the West, with the aim of participating in the articulation of what Dr. Gaffney, together with Dr. Zach Stein and colleagues, are calling cosmoerotic humanism. If you enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy today's conversation between Paul and Mark as they discuss love. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Super excited for our discussion today with a very, very deep, intelligent, interesting man, Mark Gaffney, who has written a number of books, but the one that I was fortunate enough to be given by or turned on to by my buddy Amy Fournier was The Erotic and the Holy on audiobook, which was freaking awesome. In fact, so awesome. I think I listened to the whole thing twice and filled an entire notebook and part of another one with notes. And our title today is Love with a great big question mark. Mark, it's such a great pleasure to have you here with me today on Living 4D. Paul, mad delight. I'm I'm delighted. I was delighted with our previous conversations that we got to have kind of preparing and what a night it's going to be. Amen. Let's get into it. So, you know, Mark, uh, one of the things I found really interesting, as I shared with you previously, is as I was listening to The Erotic and the Holy, your descriptions of Eros and Agape were, were uh, Agape were quite different than the Greek. And what I found good about it is, at first, I was confused. You know, and, and a lot of people invert yin and yang. I can show you several books where the qualities of yin yes, are ascribed to correct. yang and vice versa. And so I thought, well, maybe this is just a different perspective on polarity. But as you got deeper, especially into Eros, I felt that your descriptions were much deeper and more penetrating, actually. And, and you know, that's right. a pun, but a uh, truth um, than the Greek. And, and so even though initially I was like, OK, what is he really getting at here? By the time I you know, got with you far enough into your process, I thought, wow, there's some really amazing concepts in here. So I thought that was fascinating. And I remember listening to the audio book and thinking, I got to get this guy on a podcast. I got to get this guy on a podcast. And so one thing led to another and we got connected. And I'm really grateful to be able to share this. I think the things that we're going to talk about today are super important on many levels. I mean, as the listeners are about to find out, I mean, we're talking about the things that are at the very, very core of human psychological health, physical health, emotional health, mental health, spiritual health. You know, uh, you can't, you you know, you can't evade concepts like love and consciousness and the psyche and relationships and things like that. And, you know, I did my best when I put the outline together to try to also bring it into the light of the events of the day. So it's not just a kind of a deep metaphysical, theological, theoretical, religious discussion, but we kind of bring it into the real world. I'd I'd like to start with by asking you a question about something I haven't heard you talk about, but I'm quite sure knowing your background, you'll have an opinion on, and that's the Imago Dei archetype. And for, for the listeners, if you're not familiar, the Imago Dei means image of deity. So it's a person's perception of God. And Jung says it's impossible to determine if your Imago Dei creates you or you create it. He also states that the Imago Dei archetype is the archetype from which all other archetypes emerge. Jung, as do I, feel that one's belief in God 
is the greatest single influence on the person's psychic orientation in life, how yeah. they use their mind, how they think, who they deem a friend or an enemy, their political orientation, their relationship to sex, art, dance, entertainment, education, what their conscious or unconscious myth is, what holidays they celebrate, and about every as essential aspect of their life. The fact that our cultural myths worldwide are breaking down has been well described by experts such as Freud, Jung, Joseph Campbell, Nietzsche, and others all the way back as early as the First World War, they started writing about this. And as you well know, we are now facing the emergence of the new religion of scientism, where God becomes the power of technology and mm -hmm. nothing that can't be weighed or measured is considered to be real. And the concept of God and the soul are literally being thrown in the trash can by uh, Klaus Schwab, Harari, and, and team. So uh, <laughs> I would love to hear your perspective on Jung, uh, Jung's comments on the Imago Dei archetype and how that influences our personal and cultural myth and what you feel is at the root of the world transition we're going through from this perspective. Right, Paul, you, you have just beautifully covered so many topics, so beautifully and so artfully. <laughs> and there, are, there are so many ways in there. Yeah, um, well, and, take, take your and, pick. <laughs> no, so beautiful. So just a gorgeous, you know, a gorgeous framing, you know, and, you know, it's um, that scene in the beginning of, what was the movie? The Matrix. Yes. Which is a, a wonderful movie and actually had a, a bunch of long talks with Lana about her movie you know, in Chicago when I was, was with her, where we argued about the interpretation of her movie, because of course, the fact that you made the movie doesn't mean that you get to interpret it. But in the beginning of the matrix, there's a the meeting between Neo and Trinity. And in their meeting, you know, they say, why are we meeting? And they say, because we're asking the same question. Oh. And, and, and so your question was, you know, the questioning, the question is the quest I'm on, right? It's where I'm going. The question is, points me in the direction and actually, in, in the great lineage traditions of Hebrew wisdom, the, the kasha in Aramaic, the question is so much more important than the response or the answer. And so I just want to just honor the beauty of your question and its depth Thank you. and its nuance and its, its wonder. So just a couple of small things. Just let's kind of talk about what we're not going to talk about, and then we'll talk about what we're <laughs> going to talk about. So, so, so we won't talk about the distinction that you alluded to between, let's say, Kashmir Shaivism, which is early Hinduism, and Taoism, which invert the yin and yang. Yes. Meaning they, they invert the masculine and feminine. That's an important inversion. And, you know, and how we work out, and maybe we'll do a different podcast at a different time on the masculine and feminine. I call that lines and circles. Yeah, I love that part of your erotic yeah. and the holy. I thought it was a beautiful way to describe yeah. it. You're the only one I've ever heard do that. Yes, it's enormously important. And lines and circles are primordial structures of reality before the engendered masculine and feminine. So yes. that's a whole conversation we're not going to have. We're going to bracket that for now. Well, they can people can listen to your audio yeah. book, The Erotic yeah, and the Holy. Great, that's fantastic. And then, you know, the second question or the second issue you raised about eros and agape and the split between them maybe we'll come to later yeah right so well so we'll, we'll get to that later so let's let's go to the third part of what you said which was homo amago day right one and then how does that respond to you know the kind of contemporary crisis we're in you invoked kind of the great we reset with klaus schwab you invoked my colleague yuval harari and, and of course, mentioned, you know, in a breath, Jung, Nietzsche, and a whole host of other people. There's yeah. a lot. There's a lot there. Um, yeah. So so let me just kind of start in the middle with your permission. Yes. Just just so you're clear, what I'm really trying to get out of you is the Imago Dei archetype, the image totally. of Totally. We're going, we're, going, right? we're going right in there. So How Imago does that Dei. affect Imago us? Dei. Totally. I'm completely with that. I just wanted to honor the fullness of the question before diving in. So Imago Dei. So you're referring to very beautifully one of, you know, an critical and beautiful ancient text, which is Genesis 126, which says, Nasa Adam B'Tselem Elohim. The human being is manifest, created, homo imago Dei, in the image of the divine. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question is, what does that mean? Yeah. And Jung, Jung, of course, is emerging out of that tradition. And Jung... Jung had a deep sense of the Hebrew lineage tradition combined with many other lineages, which spoke of the following. 
and it's very, very beautiful. And let's see if we can imagine something for a second. Imagine you have a circle and then another circle. So one circle is God and the other circle is the world. Two circles and those, then you need a line between the two circles. And the question is, how do those two circles talk to each other? Right. That's one view of reality. Mm -hmm. And that was the primary public view of reality of public religion for several thousand years. However, in the what I call the interior sciences of the great tradition, there's a second view. And I want to try and cut through all the literature and just kind of sum this up for your awesome listeners in a very, very hopefully clear way. And I hope it's helpful to people. The second view, and this is what Jung is referring to, and it comes from deep in the interior sciences, is that there's not two circles. There's one circle and there's a triangle in the circle. Yeah. Right. The and holy trinity. So while the triangle, the triangle, let's say the triangle is the human being. It's human consciousness. Okay. Right. Human, simple triangle, human consciousness. But the human consciousness is not a separate circle. It's in the circle of the divine. Yes. So the human consciousness experiences itself as separate. And actually, the invitation of human consciousness is to realize that I am Metatron or that I am Metatron is one name in the lineage, that I am actually participatory in the divine field, that I'm not talking to God only, although there is a sense that we'll get to in which I'm held by the divine, mm -hmm. but not only am I held by the divine, which I am, we'll talk about that, but I also participate directly in the divine field. Amen. So we, we might, amen, hallelujah, we might yeah. call that a participatory universe. I, I so, like that. So that's really what, what Jung was referring to, and he was drawing it from the interior sciences, is that we live not in a universe of two circles talking to each other, man and God, or man, woman and God, but actually it's one circle. There's a triangle in the middle of that one circle, and the triangle needs to realize that I'm in the circle that I'm participatory. So that, and the implications of that are enormous. And this gets to the issue that you raised about my friend Harari, right? So let me, let me, just, and, and I think you're pointing to an enormously important danger. So with your permission, let me just elaborate on that piece of your question. Yes. If you could though, before you do, what does the triangle symbolize, i.e., you know, I, I immediately thought it was the Holy Trinity because that's the classic depiction and being in the center of a circle that represents God. So what are what is the triangular or the tripart relationship you're pointing to as the human being in there? Well, the, the, there's many ways to think about that, that triad. That triad could be body, mind, and heart, right? Which is probably yeah. the, the simplest way, right? Because I have an experience that my body, my mind, and heart are mine when actually there's one heart. And one love, right? There's there's one body, right? And when when there's there's one mind, and we're participatory in that one mind, we're participatory in that one heart. Now, we're not absorbed in that one heart. We don't disappear into the one heart. We're an individuated expression of the one heart. In other words, the one heart is the field. There's a field. It's called in Aramaic chakel. Tapuchin Kadishin, right? The field of the one heart. And we are uniquely individuated expressions of the field of the one heart. So the heart of Paul Czech, which is kind of self evident and obvious, is irreducibly <laughs> unique and gorgeous. Thanks, unlike, yours too. Unlike any other that ever was, is, or will be. And so Paul Czech is the heart, the one heart expressing itself in an irreducibly unique way. And then when that one heart experiences Paul Check, that one heart has an experience of shocking self-recognition. Yes. Right? She recognizes herself in Paul Check in a way that she couldn't recognize herself in any other being that ever was, is, or will be. Yes. And the she that you're referring to is the divine. The she is, is the homo imago dei. Right. Is, is the one heart. Right. Is the one love is the one mind. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 The now, the field that Rumi speaks of when he says the beyond field, judgment, there's a field. I'll meet you there. That that field that Rumi speaks of. Right. That field, which is only the beloved, the field beyond good and evil. Right? Yeah. The field that underlies, which is the ground of all being, is not just as the Buddhists suggested, the ground of awareness. 
You know, when I spent some time, the Dalai Lama and I had a, it's a long story. We had a fight once at the <laughs> That's cute. I can just so visualize that, that. It's true. We actually had, we had a little bit of a fight over it. So it's a funny story um, where he, we, we had like a bunch of us had gathered at the Pope's summer residence at Castel Gandolfo. And, you know, the, the Dalai Lama had invited a whole bunch of kind of, kind of countercultural spiritual leaders, whatever. Now, Paul, just between us, getting together with spiritual teachers for a week is annoying. I mean, just, <laughs> right. I mean, it just, I'm saying, cause no one can just hang out. Like, you know, you ask someone to pass the salt, they say, I'd be honored in the name of all the stars to pass the salt. Pass me the fucking salt, man. Yeah. Right, the salt, right? <laughs> Let's right. keep like, it simple. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. So, so it was a wild week. Beautiful people, actually. It was really yeah. beautiful people. But there was a moment there. You know, I was, I was living in Israel at the time. And there was a moment, you know, I was having a big debate with a, a wonderful Syrian woman there. And it became kind of quite, you know, a dramatic moment. And, you know, you know. Michael Beckwith, who was there, who's a beautiful guy from, um, you know, L.A., Michael said, Mark's not Jewish, he's joyish. Right? <laughs> right? Love it. And the, the Dalai Lama says, kind of really trying to kind of, you know, hold me and take my position. He says, you know, he says um, something like, Israelis, very hard. Mark, very nice. <laughs> and then he said, then he said, Jews, sometimes hard. Mark, nice. Right. And it was like, I was like, and he kind of triggered that spontaneous age regression you have when I was kind of like, you know, a Jewish kid in Columbus, Ohio, and people were throwing eggs and saying kike, you know, so I, I was a little bit mad at him. So I, I crossed the room. This is a true story. It's on film. I crossed the room. I gave him my yarmulke, my, my skull cap you know, that I used to wear at the time. And I said, if you think it's so easy, you wear it. So he looks at me. The whole room is now silent. I've like ruined the thing, right? And it's like, they're not a word. He looks at me. I, I look at him. We're total silence. He calls his assistant. He says, need to wear yarmulke. Bring visor. So they brought him a sun visor. He put it. He says, Buddhist monk, bald, hard to wear yarmulke. Put on the yarmulke. He wore it the entire day. And then as he was leaving, he sent me a note through Atra Grinpache, his key librarian. He said, Come visit me in Dharamsala and I'll give you your yarmulke back. <laughs> That's beautiful. So that I means did. I still have things to say to you. <laughs> right, right. So I did. So, so we went, you know, I, I went there and we, we kind of did the yarmulke, which was kind of wild, right? So, so blessings to the Dalai Lama. So we, we were there and, you know, we were trying to have this deep conversation about Buddhism and awareness. And Buddhism holds that the field that you're describing is a field of awareness, yes. as you know so well. But actually, when you look deeper into the, the best Buddhist texts in Vajrayana, and certainly in, in other interior sciences, it's not quite a field of awareness. It's a field of, of awareness, eros, and desire. Right? There's act, it's a pulsing field that's alive with love. It's alive with eros. It's alive with allurement. Mm -hmm. Right? And that field itself is a web of allurements in which I am a unique set of allurements that emerge from that field. Yes. So, so if I ask myself, why am I talking to Paul today? I'm talking to Paul today really because I'm a lord. That's Me why I'm too. Here. I'm a lord. That's, that's, what, that's what got my interest in your work is, is that allurement. You know, I, I felt substance in it. And, and I found your work unique. I've read a lot of anyone listening to the podcast that follows me know I'm I'm a well studied guy. And so when I started listening to the erotic and the holy and through the whole thing, I thought, wow, you know, these are very unique angles and concepts that I haven't heard even reading uh Kabbalah books or Jewish books or any of the stuff that I've read. And, and I thought, wow, I've got to talk to this guy because he's somehow able to see something that the Orthodox and even non-Orthodox people looking in and into and talking about these topics are not picking up. So I, I just want to congratulate you for that. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I, I madly appreciate it. And, and just to come to the tenderly to your, your, your inquiry. So what's the relationship between Homo Amago Dei and what's happening in the world today? So Homo Amago Dei, let me try and say it a little differently, is the field of consciousness, the field of desire, and the field of value. Mm -hmm. Why do you put homo in front of it? Because classically, the word homo is not in there. It's, it's an archetype. So there's not a homo in an archetype. Uh, but homo amago dei means that the human being is not just a homo sapien, right? which is a genus. I'm uh -huh. not just wise. 
I'm homo imago dei. I'm a homo, a genus that's not really sapien wise, but I'm imago dei. I'm participatory in the field of the divine. Okay. So that, uh, that I needed to know that because yes, if I'm absolutely. confused, someone else might be. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what, what, what essentially Klaus Schwab right, and, <laughs> I gotta Harari, hear this. <laughs> and Harari are assuming is, and this is tragic. Yeah, they're assuming that actually, they're and they're 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 not philosophers. Yuval's a, a pretty decent historian and kind of a good raconteur and a good writer, right? Klaus, you know, has his vision of the world, right? What they're assuming is is that there's no field of value. That's yes, critical, that's a very good point. Critical to understand. So, in essence. They've deconstructed the field of value, not because they've done it directly. They're actually parrots of late modernity and post-modernity merged together, which from David Hume and on have deconstructed the field of value. And I want to just give you an example of the way that sounds and feels. So for example, Yuval, you know, my dear friend Yuval in chapter two of Homo sapiens says, that the only distinction, there's, he says, there's no ultimate distinction between, let's say, Qaddafi's Libya and universal human rights. They're both just, and I'm quoting directly from chapter two, they're both just fictions, figments of our imagination, and social constructs. Once there's no field of value, then there's no unique personhood, right? Because unique personhood, personhood's a value. And uniqueness is a value. Once there's no unique personhood, once there's no choice, Yuval assumes, as he writes in another book called Homo Deus, an entire chapter, that choice does not exist. Schwab assumes that choice does not exist as a value or as a reality. So once you assume there's no field of value, once you assume there's no what I call first principles and first values, once you assume that unique personhood is not a value, and that personhood's not a value, then if you're faced with existential risk, what you're going to do is you're going to try and control the entire story. If they assume that there's no field of value and there's no choice, then why are they imposing their values and using the power of their choices on the rest of the world? Be, that, that's a beautiful question. And that's the what you just pointed out brilliantly is what we might call the, perf the the technical word for it is, it's a fancy word, but it's simple, is there's an, a performative contradiction at the heart of modernity and post-modernity. Meaning on the one hand, we say there's no field of value. On the other hand, we say that our values are, are the best ones. Yes, right? I, I call it manipulation and greed myself. Man manipulation and greed is, 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 is one of the expressions of it, but there's a very deep contradiction, right, deep in the system. Now, I, I want to actually give you another perspective. If I can challenge, you know, a little bit as the two men, we can have this conversation. I love it. Give it, give it to me, baby. I don't, I don't think Yuval's coming from manipulation and greed. I don't think that's his, his You just think he's just so deep into his own belief system, he can't I, I see think anything else. I think it's actually even deeper than that. I think Klaus Schwab is even deeper than that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you something which is, is very dramatic. I'm actually about to publish a book with my colleague, Zach Stein, on what we call techno-feudalism. Love to and, hear about it. And I think what's actually motivating Klaus Schwab and Harari is that which motivated their hidden teacher. You know, and whenever you have, a, you always have a Sith Lord and an apprentice, right? In Star Wars, right? Yes. Now, or when you say hidden teacher, do you, are you referring to a, a physical human being? Or are yes, you referring yes. to an no, alien no, I, or no, 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 an intelligence? They, have, they actually have a person that they're modeling themselves on, who's actually a hidden teacher that they never cite. They hide their relationship to him, but he's actually the person that actually dominates their thought. And we've actually shown in this book that everything they're doing actually directly emerges. His name is B.F. Skinner. Oh, you're kidding me. Yes. That sound, now that you say that, it's obvious. Right. Isn't it's that wild? It's freaking behavioral control. Actually, B.F. Skinner, who was the reigning Don at Harvard for six decades, who writes a book. Now, stay close. This is wild, Paul. We're now going to unearth something, maybe for the first time in, in public, and it's, it's shocking and much more shocking than anyone can imagine. So B.F. Skinner writes a book in 1948 called Walden II. 
And Walden too is written, you know, around the same time as Orwell's 1984, but it's much more frightening. And Walden too is about how you create a community. And in that, and this is about a community that he created as it were in fiction called Walden too. And he creates absolute control over the community with no one knowing that the control is being exercised. In other words, there are invisible levers of control. Sounds now, wireless. Wireless, exactly. Now, Skinner had a notion called a Skinner's box. And in a Skinner's box, you have rats and pigeons, and you create what Skinner called schedules of reinforcement mm -hmm. to cause the rats and the pigeons to behave in a particular way. Pavlovian. So, so, well, Skinner emerges out of Pavlov. Pavlov was working directly with Lenin and then Stalin, and he was a key figure in the Soviet Union. There were about 400 centers that Pavlov actually ran, right? Right in, and Skinner and Pavlov were in direct touch. So Skinner is very different than Pavlov, but he's working in the same model. And, but Skinner is motivated not by evil. This is the very, very important to understand because one of the mistakes and some of the, the echo chambers is this assumption that these guys are all just power and greed. Some of them are, right? There's a lot of power and greed stuff, but there's actually another motivation. Skinner actually believed and got very early that we were facing what we might call existential risk. Now it's planetary catastrophe because he didn't believe in humanity. He didn't believe <laughs> in the human heart. He didn't believe yeah. in human possibility. He believed that the only way we could avoid that disaster was to exert total control and to transform all of the world into a controlled environment, which was controlled not by politics. Politics became irrelevant, was controlled by invisible, what he called controllers, who were actually behind the scenes manipulating reality. Now, stay with me one more step. This is going to be even more shocking. There's a book called The Orange Glow. Right by Brian Deere, which analyzes the rise of the web world. And you know who the first chapter is about? B.F. Skinner. Wow. Because B.F. Skinner was deeply connected to the rise of the internet because he viewed the internet world as the modality which would allow for the creation of Walden 2, the worldwide Skinner's box. And he actually writes that we don't have instruments and methods to accomplish this control on a worldwide basis, along comes the MIT Media Lab, and they develop, they represent the development of this entire new force in the world called data science. And data science takes the Skinner's box and basically transposes it onto the web and allows for the reduction of human beings to their lowest common denominator. We get upgraded algorithms and downgraded human beings, but they're doing it. You know, the MIT Media Lab, Skinner, Schwab, and Harari, because they actually believe that this is the only choice we have, and they believe there's no value. There's no choice. So if you believe there's no free will, and you believe that human personhood is not a value, and you believe that human uniqueness is not a value, and you believe that eros and love as Skinner says very clearly in Walden 2, is just a schedule of reinforcement, just a lever of control, then why wouldn't you try and control the world through a Skinner's box? So we just got to the heart of the matter, which is, I think, so critical. It is, but there's a paradox in it. Please. You said they were concerned of some sort of an existential crisis, right? Some of them. Skinner was. Okay, right? good. The MIT Media Lab is, and Harari is. Okay, so it means that they're doing this to try to avoid some kind of an existential crisis. But the point is, here's the paradox. They've created one. COVID itself has destroyed the psychology of children, people's health, safety, security, without going on. Paul, you're, you are, Paul you are absolutely right. So if I can frame it for you in one sentence with your permission. Please. There's two forms of existential risk. One is the death of humanity, meaning we actually, we go down. Yeah. The second is what I call the death of our humanity. Yes. And it, essentially what you're saying, which I think is absolutely right, and Zach and I write it in techno feudalism, is that in the attempt to save us from the death of humanity, they're directly causing 
the second form of existential risk, the death of our humanity. And that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. In shamanic terms, they are inducing soul loss on a global scale. They are inducing the downgrading of our essential humanity and the corroding of the essential eros of the human being and the reduction of the human being to a nanobot on a web. And what do they actually think is going to happen if they succeed with this? I mean, you know, you and I know enough about human psychology, human physiology, nurture, love, connection, and Skinner did all sorts of research with monkeys and wire mothers. And, you know, he knows damn well that you cannot use a, a, a metal monkey to be your mother. Yet here we are turning, they're trying to be the mother and the father of the world, reducing human beings to objects. So the ultimate point I'm driving at here is without a long expose in psychology, physiology, and everything else, they're actually creating a worldwide psychological trauma that will have physiological consequences that will ultimately lead to the same exact stuff that happens to people in prison camps. And all you got to do is read Desmond Morin's, Morris's book, The Human Zoo, to see how that plays out. You are, you are, you are, I think you're completely right, Paul. And, and, and let me just say it clearly. One of the greatest dangers facing humanity today is that the legacy institutions. Now, there's an entire vector that's motivated by profit and greed. That's absolutely true. So I want to bracket that for a second. because That's been pointed out and that's true. The danger is as follows. The profit and greed vector merges with this kind of utopian messianic vector of techno-utopians who have dismissed, disqualified the field of value and therefore feel like they are actually the controllers. And the result of that is 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 actually a techno-utopia, which is the ultimate dystopia in which they use the potential death of humanity, health threats to the very existence of humanity in order to cause the death of our humanity. And the only response to that has to be, right, revolution. Yes. But revolution, I mean, like revolution, but revolution has to mean that we actually articulate a new world philosophy. Yes, I, I think we are, and we're going to get into this. I That's think. what we're doing here together. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wanted to make a real difference in the world? CEO of the Czech Institute, Gavin Jennings, and I designed the Czech Academy to be the most comprehensive, complete system in the world for learning the art, science, and practice of holistic health. The Czech Academy is a multidisciplinary education system that teaches you all the essential functional anatomy, physiology, and assessments you'll need to identify the root cause of people's common body and health challenges. You will learn how to perform sensory, motor, autonomic nervous system testing, and specific orthopedic tests to determine exactly what is wrong with each client and what to do about the findings and which specific medical and healthcare professionals to refer to for a comprehensive, multidisciplinary approach to healing, performance enhancement, and well-being. You will learn how to assess a client's diet and lifestyle factors to bring anyone back to balance and educate them and their family on how to stay healthy. The Czech approach isn't a this-for-that supplement-based approach, but is based on the science of organic farming principles and whole food nutrition, which is what we need in the world now more than ever. You will learn how to use work in exercises to calm the mind and cultivate life force energy. These practices are simple enough that anyone can do them and they support your immune system, calm and clear your mind, and are excellent for stress management. Work in exercises also integrate the brain, heart, and organ systems, making our internal systems much more stable while greatly enhancing our ability to heal from any health challenge or injury. All Czech Academy students are guided by highly skilled, experienced instructors and mentors and learn a scientific approach to stretching, joint mobilization, postural correction, movement skills development, corrective, and high-performance exercise. All the prerequisite training for each level of your journey through the Holistic Lifestyle Coaching and Integrated Movement Science Training Levels 1 through 5 are provided. 
You will be part of a tribe of healthy, open-minded people from around the world that share a genuine interest in mastery and helping people look great, feel great, and live their dreams. Students and graduates of the Czech Academy are successful in their own studios, clinics, have started their own health and healing retreats, work for elite sports teams, in big corporations, in gyms, physical therapy, chiropractic, osteopathic, and medical clinics, and have served as private coaches and guides for many elite people, ranging from those in the movie, music, dance, and other industries. As you are surely aware, there has never been a better time to master holistic health, corrective and high performance exercise. People are finally waking up to the fact that they need skilled, personalized help from people with genuine mastery because so many have been unable to get healthy through standard medical approaches. The Czech Institute is now accepting applications for spring semester of the Czech Academy. Applications close on April the 15th. The Czech Institute is offering three partial scholarships for the program, one in each region, North America, South Pacific, and UK plus Europe. To learn more and apply, go to academy.checkinstitute.com. That's academy.checkinstitute.com. Everything you need to know is right there for you on the website, and our staff is happy to answer any additional questions you may have. We don't believe in being average, but we do teach excellence. Join now and make yourself invaluable. I think, you know, and, and I talked about myth breakdown. We, we, Please. We've got to hold still, especially the artists, the poets, the musicians, um, the mystics. Yeah, we've got to collectively usher in a myth. I don't believe a myth is something you can conjure up. I think a myth comes from a transcendent source. We've got to stop being so distracted and so buzzed out and and sit still and open ourselves to guidance from a transcendent source or, 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 or you know, what I would call God. Gorgeous. So that, 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 gorgeous, Paul. So let's go back to the, 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 the citation from Jung, which Jung says, the citation that you cited earlier on, does homo imago dei create us or do we create homo imago dei? So this is this is very, very, very important that the two are actually blurred because we participate in the divine field. Yes. So what we need to do today is, and let's see if we can kind of create a language around it. We need to articulate a new story, a new story of value, right? And I, li- I like the language and not a fabricated new story, not a contrived new story. We need to integrate the validated insights of all of the wisdom streams, traditional, modern, pre-modern, weave them together in this renaissance way into a new story of value that we can explain to 75 truckers in Idaho, to 30 dentists in China, which becomes a universal grammar of value as a context for our diversity. And that is we don't, that's the most important response to the meta crisis because the only thing that changes the vector of history is a new story. And if I can just imagine with you for a second and, and turn it back to you, imagine we're in the Renaissance, right? And the pandemic is right, blowing the Renaissance, the Black Death, right? And, and no one knows what to do. And no, you can't go into every village and save everyone. So the Medicis get together with Da Vinci and Ficinio. And there's a there's only a thousand people involved in the Renaissance, not more. Wow. Are you saying factually? Factually, you know, Paul Tillich points out that the actual players in the Renaissance, there weren't more than a thousand people. Well, they sure did a huge change. <laughs> and right, and what did they do? And we have to do the same thing with that's they that's did. the point. If they can do it with a thousand, that's right. then we can do it with a thousand. We, we have and we, absolutely. And it's what they did was they told a new story of value. And that new story of value was modernity. Now, to the ex- and that was universal human rights and the emergence of the feminine and the scientific method and new ways of you know, information gathering. Now, to the precise extent that they got the plot lines of that story right, they produced the dignities of modernity. But to the precise extent that they got some of the plot lines wrong, like they threw value out, right? They threw out, right, the field of infinite intimacy that we participate in. Well, let me let me interject. Please I, take I it think, away, sir. I, I think that they didn't throw the whole field of value out. They threw out ob they threw out subjective value, but they kept objective value, which is what materialism is based on. 
they, they got, well, they kept, I think what you mean is they kept measurable value. Yes, they yes. kept, they kept that which can be ascribed to a thing, but they took away love. They took away feeling. They took away friendship. They took away your, your connection. Absolute, in other words, the entire movement of modernity was the movement from classification and Aristotle to measurement. Kepler, Galileo, right? Newton, they're measuring. And measurement became that which was real. So anything that wasn't measurable was disqualified, but actually value is the field of the priceless. You know, you and I chatted this morning and the other day. That was precious beyond imagination. It was, these were priceless moments. We yeah. couldn't quantify them. We couldn't commodify them. So measurement reduced value to the measurable, which was utterly tragic. And what we need to do is, just like the Renaissance was a time between worlds, it was a time between stories yeah. in which we were threatened by everything. So we had to come together, a thousand of us, and together tell a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values. We are again at a time between worlds, at a time between stories. But this time, brother, we're faced with exponential technologies with extraction models, right? That are taking out of planet Earth what it took a billion years to create with, with, with case systems, fractional reserve banking, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know, a host of 15 existential risks. And the only way that we're going to actually be able to succeed in actually responding to the meta crisis and changing the vector of history is to begin to inhabit and to create from within a new story of value. And that's the myth you're talking about. Well, I'm going to add something to the Please. mix. We're in a very dangerous position, even with that approach, for the reasons I'm going to cite, and I'm excited to hear your thoughts in this regard. You're very steeped in integral psychology and philosophy, and you know you cannot, you, you, if you transcend a level of consciousness without including it, you create a dysfunction. So if I just use a simple model like Gene Gebser's, we have the archaic, right. the magic, the mythic, the mental, and we're now coming into the integral state. Yes. But what we've done is we've lost touch with the archaic. We think that's just shit you package up and sell and make cell phones out of. <laughs> The the, right. the magic, we, we label people like that as schizophrenics and psychopaths and put them in jail. And that's where we go when we take plant medicines and, and reconnect ourselves to nature. Yep. The mythic is the storytelling and understanding the depth of myth, not as some kind of a fact, but as something that's pointing to something that you cannot objectify. And right. we're heavily trapped in the mental where we worship ideas as more real than the earth, the water, the fire, than the air that keeps us alive, that is dying because of all the scientocracy, the use of chemicals, electromagnetic pollution, and the list is long. But the problem is, is as we're moving into this integral phase where Gebser talks about the diaphanous, the seeing through, the merging of time, and, 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 and what looks like a schizophrenic experience to someone that's not ready for it, if we keep going down this technological path, as we create a new myth, but we do not reconnect ourselves to the archaic, the magic, and the mythic, we're just going to destroy ourselves with another technology. No, that, that, that is so well said and so beautiful. And you, your invocation of Gepser is very important. Gepser was wildly important. And you know what you're saying, Paul, is if I can just reflect it back and perhaps add some dimension, and I Please. think it's, it's beautiful, is that let me try and say it this way. Let me try and give you a, a different image, and then we'll go back to your image. What's the problem? What's the problem with AI, artificial intelligence? So the well, problem with our oh, okay, I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um. I, it was. It was only for a moment, and then I'll pass it back to you with your permission. No. Yeah. Go for it, please. I love. I love your your concepts. I. I I'm. I'm. I'm already in love with Mark. We're playing. I'm, I'm, I'm madly in love with Paul, right? This, I'm so excited to talk to you, right? Because, because it's, and I'm excited to talk to you because of the space that you create. There's a space in between yeah. that comes from, and so I'm, I'm delighted and honored to be with you. So let's look at AI. So what's the problem with AI? The problem with AI is, is that artificial intelligence is super computational power, which bypasses 
everything that came before. So a human being, and let's go slow, friends, for a second. A human being has within him or her, you know, gluons, quarks, muons, hadrons, leptons, right, protons, neutrons, right, atoms, molecules, right, complex molecules, macromolecules, cells. Now, how do all of those aggregate? How do you get, let's say, three quarks become with an up quark become a proton, three quarks with a down quark become a neutron. But how do three quarks come together? They're allured to each other. Love, baby. They're allured. There's actually, there's actually, there's eros between them. Yeah. Right? How do subatomic particles become an atom? Right. Love, baby. Right. They're allured to each other. That's what I call the universe colon a love story. Right. Yeah. That is to say there's allurement, not just allurement, but let me add something. There are value choices that are made all the way up and all the way down the evolutionary chain. And that's from the world of matter, right? All the way to the cellular world, the world of the biosphere of life until the human world and all the stage of the human world. All of those are levels of evolving love and allurement. AI bypasses all of that, has no access to any of those fields, yep. and then operates on raw computational power. Now, that's what's happening today is, and that's what I think you were pointing to, the technological world, right, has basically focused on exterior technologies and the gap between interior technologies and exterior technologies in that gap civilization falls. Exactly. Right. And that's really what you're pointing to. So and, 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 and the fall is a double meaning. The fall is a double meaning. That's the original fall, right? And it's, and it's an actual fall. I mean, think about it for a second, Paul. All civilizations have fallen. We haven't solved any of the problems that caused them to fall. No. Nope. We now have, as Joseph Tainter pointed out, a global civilization. Yes. Right? With exponential technologies, without having solved any of the original problems. So, of course, the civilization is going to fall. How could it not unless we tell a new story of value? But I want to go back with your permission, brother, to what you said about Gepsir, because it was so important. Before you do, can I just interject a, a key point before we before the, the point of goes course. cold? There's another problem with AI. AI is based on algorithms. AI correct? is in part, in part based on algorithms, yes. Well, it's heavily influenced by algorithms. Take it away. Okay. The problem with algorithms is they're based on collections of large data sets. And large data sets destroy individuality. The analogy I've used many times on the podcast, and I'll use it again, Marie-Louise von Franz says, you can have a stack of stones, two, two tons of stones with an average weight of two kilograms and weigh every one of them, never find a single stone that weighs two kilograms. That's right. Okay. The point I'm making is, and I'll, because I work in the medical and health field, Doctors today do not engage the person. They engage a bunch of numbers on a piece of paper that came from various tests, but they don't actually realize that that is not the person. Those are numbers that are generated by what's happening within the person's life as a product of their story, which carries their beliefs, which leads to their judgments, their choices, and their actions that led them to being sick. Oh, my sick. God. You, are you can't. You cannot. Gorgeous. Treat a human being based on fucking data and this whole friggin' system, Bill Gates and all these assholes are putting together. Forgive me for that criticism. I love the fact that you're God, guys, but you're lost. You cannot. Impossible. I've been in this game for 40 fucking years. You cannot do health, medicine, psychology, any of it off of data sets. It is the biggest trap in the world. The problem is they make billions and billions of dollars off that illusion. And this is where greed comes in. But let's go back to the, your complete, first off, gorgeous. I, 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 I mean, every single word I'm with you and with your permission, let me just elaborate on a couple of your words and just unpack, let's unpack them together. Yeah. So, and then we'll go to Gebser because I want to we'll, hear- We'll go back to Gebser, but no, but this is so important what you I said. I blow so, smoke to Gebser almost every morning. I got a no, beautiful no. picture of him. Man. Gebser's awesome. He's a rock star, but let's stay here for a second because it's yeah. so gorgeous and so important. So one, the entire nation, the entire notion of science in general, which which emerges out of data sets, particular forms of science, is actually to avoid the anomaly, meaning to avoid uniqueness. 
Yeah. The entire nature of the structure of the system avoids uniqueness. It's an industrial approach. It's a factory. It's a freaking assembly line. I, I would call it a medical industrial complex. Yes. Right? There's a medical industrial complex, which is which is tragic. And even Ivan Illich wrote about it beautifully. There's a book called Medical Nemesis from 1971, which is, I think, the source code text on this. But let's go back for a second. Let's go even a step before. Let's go back to the algorithm. You, you, you made two points, and both of them were so important and so good that they. I want to make sure that we all get them together. And I'll see if I can add something to them with your permission. Please, so I love first, it, man. The first point was about the algorithms, right? Yeah. So the, the way machine intelligence operates is that it actually looks for micro patterns. Mm -hmm. But micro patterns are based on, let's say, gathering all of the digital exhaust or what they call the digital breadcrumbs. It's also called reality mining in the MIT Media Lab to gather everything you've ever done on the web. But everything you've ever done on the web is not, it's not what pornographic sites you looked at. That's what everyone's worried about. It's not that, <laughs> right? It's not that. No, no one really cares much about that, right? It's about, which different conversation, but it's about something else. It's about actually how long did your finger hover above the mouse? What's your pattern of typing, right? How do you response? How do you respond to a sequence of prompts, right? If there's a three second or four second music, Right. If it's a black cat or a white cat, in other words, what basically it is, it's an analysis of how you respond to prompts and nudges, they're called to bait forms of reinforcement bait. And it actually machine intelligence creates predictive patterns of what your unconscious micro patterns and habits are. That's a tragedy, meaning that, what it means. I, is, I have to interject for one second. Please. That's, that's true. The problem is that's a tragedy. It is. And there's a problem with that idea. And the problem is, is that they're responding to what's in front of them. They're not in responding to the reality of human life. No, totally. The point you see, they're, they're responding to what's being put in front of them. Like you put a lure in front of a fish, like we talked about previously. In other words, in, in other words, I'm not transforming myself. I'm not doing the deep work of human joy and transformation. It's all about creating a system of reducing human beings to their unconscious and visceral lowest common denominator reaction, when in fact, the entire point of being a human being is being on the hero's journey of transformation. Yes. And it's what they're doing is black magic straight up. It, it, it's actually it's actually technological black magic of the most insidious kind because it's invisible Right. And it, it literally reshapes the human personality and reduces it to its lowest common denominator without us even being aware that it's happening. And so it's an utter obliteration of uniqueness. It's and it's an pulling utter, us out. And it's an obliteration of the inward space of meaning in yeah. which we actually access value. It's pulling us out of the earth. It's pulling, it's pulling us, us out of out the of, elements. It's pulling us out of Aristotelian. It's pulling us Grounding. out of ourselves. It's pulling us out of ourselves. Yes, because right. you don't have a self here without earth, water, fire, air. Those things are analog. You have to have a relationship with them. You don't have to water a fucking yes. tree on your cell phone. You don't, have to, you don't have to take care of a dog on your cell phone. It pulls us out of the intrinsic space of our irreducible uniqueness. Because who are we, Paul? Who are we? I mean, the answer to the question of who are you? You're an irreducible, unique expression of right the love, intelligence, and love, beauty, and love, desire yes. of all that is right yes. that lives in you, as you, and through you. That never was, is, or will be ever again, other than right. through you. And as such, you've got a unique gift and a unique quality of influence and a unique presence that never was, is, or will be. And all of that irreducible, gorgeous uniqueness, you're a unique expression of the field of value, is actually obliterated by intention, right, by the techno-feudalist webplex today. But you said, you said a second thing, which was so important, so I don't want to lose it, which is you talked about, you know, the medical system, and you said something so important, right, which is that, and if I can, I'll say it in my terms, but we're saying the same thing. Yeah. We need today unique self-medicine. We do. That's we what need, I do for a living. <laughs> you, you are unique self-medicine, and, you know, <laughs> You know, I, I co I worked with a couple of people on our board, two beautiful guys, um, two doctors, 
a you know a cardio guy and a gastroenterologist, you know, Venu and Vinay Apali out of Houston. And we wrote a paper a bunch of years ago on unique self-medicine. Mm. And unique self-medicine is so important because healing happens through addressing and supporting your irreducible uniqueness. And actually, the core source, if you look at the leading edge research, and Perry Marshall had gathered a lot of this on his website, the, the actual source of most disease is a violation of uniqueness. And this is a very, very, very critical. Cancer is always a violation of the unique signature of the heart, body, soul. Yeah. And so therefore, only unique self-recovery can move us to healing. And what you're saying so stunningly, and you, you actually embody it, and I think you were decades ahead of the curve as an almost prophetic embodier of this realization, is that actually... The only thing that can heal us is unique self-medicine. And we're now in a moment in which actually hospital administrations are violating doctors' even ability to do medicine right? right in a horrific way. Yeah. That's one of the things that happened during the vaccine era. Whatever you think about the vaccines, hospitals were telling doctors what their decisions should be. And yeah. that's, that destroys medicine. That's fine if you're working on a, a, a bunch of army tanks or an assembly yeah, right. line. P3OM by Bioptimizers is hands down one of the most important supplements to have on you everywhere you go. If you're traveling, if you go to work, if you're going to friend's house to eat, this product will knock out food poisoning and almost any kind of gut disorder from viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever could irritate your gut so quickly. It's mind blowing. I have been using this product since Wade Lightheart first turned me on to it and he's the formulator of it. And I've got Wade here to tell us how it works, but I just want you to hear it from me. I have all my clients use this. I try to get it to friends, to family members, because it is really like your own bodyguard. So Wade, how in the world does this thing work so well every time? Well, as you know, we're very research oriented and we have literally a university in Croatia that we do microbiome testing with our labs of PhDs to find out what's the most effective formulation. And we are quickly moving into the post antibiotic world where we need to cultivate super probiotics. We all heard of super bad bacteria in hospitals and stuff that are antibiotic resistant. Well, what we did, we worked with a medical doctor that was able to take an aggressive strain of L. plantarum, which is a very aggressive strain, and then put it through almost like a BUDS camp, a Navy SEALs training, where we subjected this particular probiotic to a toxic environment. We ran a sine wave through it. And out of that survived only about somewhere between two and 3%. We then take that and grow it on very special food. We feed them just like you would feed a great athlete. You feed them special food and the probiotics develop unique capabilities. We have a U.S. patent that is so powerful. I can't read it on the airwaves because we'd get canceled. But what I can say is when you put P3OM in your body, it goes out and breaks down any undigested protein whether it's in your gut or through your blood system. And it becomes your Navy SEALs defense force, if you will, to go out and wipe out whatever pathogen might come in your body. You just need more of these guys to overwhelm it. It takes it out. It cleans up any messes. And for the last 18 years, I've been using P3OM daily. And I can honestly say, I've never been sick during that time. If I feel something coming on, I just double down my dosage take four caps every night. If I get a little, if I'm traveling, I take twice that. And it's been great. A lot of our people do it. And it's one of our best selling products. And it's available to your audience. Just go to p3om.com slash living 40, put in Paul 10, get a 10% discount. And if it's not the best probiotic you've ever had in your life, you get 100% of your money back. That's from us at Bioptimizers. That's our guarantee for you. Go get it. It's for real. I love the stuff. Thank you, Wade. There's something I want to bring up. You, you sure. must be familiar with Rudolf Steiner. Yes. And, you know, Steiner developed anthropo anthroposophic medicine, and I've studied it a lot. 
Beautiful. And one of the things that Steiner points out, he says, whenever somebody has a chronic illness, the most important thing for the physician to do is identify the patient's secret story. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Okay. That's exa- that is so gorgeous, right? And what is he saying? He's saying that what makes people ill is right. the story, the myth that they tell themselves. And without the kind of work that you do, that I do, without shadow work, without looking into your developmental history, your beliefs, your unconscious beliefs, without the real work of I love it. guided therapy by someone that knows how to guide you into the components of your own inner myth. You can't get to the etiology of what's creating the anxiety, the depression, the burned out adrenal glands, Stunning. the constipation, the sexual impotence, etc. So we're abolishing an individual's awareness of, intelligence of, and responsibility for their own secret story, their own inner myth, which is the question, who am I? What am I? Why am I here? Yeah, that is stunning. That and is what stunning, is you know? my gift to the world? That and that and that is and, and the question. You know, we call them the three great questions of cosmorotic humanism, and they are: Who am I? Where am I? And what's there to do? And at the core, you know, about 20, 22 years ago, I, I was privileged to write a book called, called Soul Prints. And you know, our dear mutual friend Aubrey, Aubrey and I have spent a lot of time studying together in this field, and. The, the chapter, the, the title of the fourth section of the book is Live Your Story. Yes. And, you know, and, and, you know, and Aubrey and I are doing a lot of shared, you know, kind of conversation in this area. But Live Your Story means that the source of your wholeness is the irreducibly unique story that reality lives through you. And, and stay, with, stay with me for a second. The point is, in evolutionary science, that reality, what evolution is saying is, As opposed to the old religions, for the old religions, reality was only an eternal fact. Evolution is saying reality is a story. Yes. That's that's a fundamental shift. Yeah. So here's how I would say it. Reality is not merely a fact. Reality is a story. Reality is not an ordinary story. Reality is a love story. Yes. Reality is not an ordinary love story. Right. It's not a it's not a social construct love story. Reality is an outrageous love story. It and is. It's and it's truly outrageous. It's an outrageous love story. And your story, the story of reality being Paul, your story is a chapter in the outrageous love story of reality. Yes. And to the precise extent that you live your story or life smaller than that, you get sick. Yes. Wow. Wow. A- amen. Amen. Right. And so what what contemporary medicine in its tragic side because there's lots of beautiful heroes doctors and nurses were gorgeous sacred heroes out there but in the institutional medical industrial complex we're basically we're doing diagnosis by reducing human being to parts and parts are not the whole no they're not human being is a whole and the whole is a story the whole is the story. Otherwise, wow. you, never get, you can't get the story without the whole story. Wow. Right. Right. I mean, so the whole of Paul is the story of Paul. Right. And, and when I meet Paul, I want I'm curious because love and curiosity are inseparable. When we stop being curious, we stop being loving. So, I mean, honestly, I'm looking forward, Paul, to us sitting down for like 10 hours that neither of us have where I just get to like, like, oh, my God, like go on a journey and hear the whole. What was reality doing in the wild story, outrageous love story of Paul? Now, here's the thing. I've painted it all. <laughs> I've painted it all. Oh, my God. Right. Right. And it's like, and there's no story like Paul's story. And nor it's yours, a, nor anybody's. Right? And so everyone has what I like to call, and this is in the Soul Prince book, a sacred autobiography. Yes, absolutely. I call it the soul signature. Gorgeous. Right. And it's the, and it's, and, it, and the soul signature is infinite divinity signing her name all over you. Yes. Wow. Right to, to, right to the electron. Right to the electron. And you actually have an irreducible, unique soul signature. And you also have an irreducible, unique molecular signature. And the violation of your soul signature, which is the interior of your molecular signature, is the source of all breakdown. Yes. Wow. You look, and I can put that another way. Please. Sir. I'll use an alchemical approach. Yes. Matter cannot organize itself. 
as I say to my students, you can stand next to a pile of rocks for a trillion years waiting for a Rolex watch to jump out or a toaster or an automobile. Matter has to be organized by some form of intelligent force or an entelechy. And the soul is what organizes the material aspects of our body, the biological aspects of our body. You know, one of the ways to look at this is people use encephalograms and functional MRIs, and, and they, right. they, they make all these decisions about consciousness coming from the brain. Right. And that's like, uh, you're, you're not paying attention to what's making the brain do what it's doing. You're, you're looking at a secondary phenomenon. Yeah, what, what, makes me, what makes me angry that doesn't make someone else angry has a lot to do with my sense of values and my sense of self. And that is a soul territory. Yeah, no, that's, that is gorgeous in what you're pointing to. And let's get to the implications of, of these beautiful words. What you're pointing to is that the process of self-organization or what we might call self-actualization, right? That we actually live in a self-actualizing cosmos and we are the self-actualizing cosmos in person. We are. Now, what you're pointing to is, is that actually... There's sentience, right? There's life, there's value all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. Because of course, reality didn't stop at hydrogen or helium or, right? Yeah. Reality continued to organize. That's eros. Eros is reality's movement towards deeper contact and self-actualization into larger holes. So what that tells us is it's actually alive. You remember the sound of music, right? The hills, yeah. the hills are alive. Ah, right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So, and so they we, are. <laughs> they are. And, it, right, and that doesn't mean that. But here's, and this is going to bring us back together. So the problem is, and this is why the rational world split off the earlier levels of consciousness, is because the attempts to bring back the shamanic, right, the magical, right, have actually in many ways failed in the new age world. The New Age world has attempted to bring back the shamanic and the mythical in ways that didn't actually look for a larger synergy with science, that didn't look for a new whole. And yeah. very, very often you have what I would call a New Age fundamentalism, which is just as nefarious right, and just as wrong and confused as the old religious fundamentalism. Yes. And we need to actually integrate. And so what happens is, so the rational world caricatures, even today, New Age fundamentalisms and rejects them because New Age, New Age fundamentalisms are, are literally as dangerous. And we need to actually integrate the best of the interior sciences and become shamans but become evolutionary shamans. Well, well I, I, what I practice, I call modern shamanism, which is the Gorgeous. marriage of everything we've learned from science, everything we've learned through Beautiful. technology. Um, you know, why does a crystal work to heal? How does it amplify a frequency? Beautiful. You know, the, the thing that science has given us is an understanding of what shamanism actually is from a perspective that we can categorize with numbers and values and, and, and say, okay, this is how this thing works. One, one of the things that I wanted Beautiful. to toss on the table is, please. you know, I've studied a lot of theosophy. I think the Theosophical Society has a lot of beautiful work in there. And um, in theosophy, they, they say there's two phases of evolution occurring at the same time. One is anthropogenic, the evolution of species or bodies, and the other is psychogenic or the evolution of the soul. The, the thing that we're talking about here is they're now basically taking the human being down to and using animal training technologies, Pavlovian Skinner, and they're getting rid of the soul, they're getting rid of God, they're getting rid of free will. And so what you have is you have this basically taking a human being, which is highly creative, very capable of emotion and love and all the things that make us human, but they're reducing that and they're taking the psychogenic aspect of ourselves and saying it doesn't exist. So what happens is you actually kill the soul and you end up with a body that's just run by an autonomic nervous system waiting to die. 
No, that, that right. That that is ex exactly and tragically right. It's actually funny. I just got a call from the Theosophical Society, who I've never heard from, asking to do a podcast, which is funny. So they well been, do it. Yeah, there's so blessings to them. But they're they, they I think they're doing really good work. I haven't tracked Theosophy carefully, honestly, right? But I'm 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 deeply aware of it. But it hasn't been. I haven't done the Blavatsky dive in the way that I should. But I think what you're describing is is absolutely right. And let's see if we can give it a word. Well, one thing the the Theosoph theosophical society is much more than Blavatsky. She was the no, no, founder, of but it's it's you no, know, I, it's, I understand. It's very very expanded. So totally understood. Totally understood. Just you know, speaking in short end. So yes, correction. You know, you know, emendation received. Let's see if we could talk about it in the most kind of elemental terms together, brother. Reality is interiors and exteriors all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. Yeah. And so reality is the evolution of exteriors and reality is the evolution of interiors. And there's your anthropogenic and psychogenic pathways. And there you have it. It's the evolution of consciousness. Yep. Right. So evolution is the evolution of consciousness and evolution is the evolution of the techno structures of reality. And when you split those two evolutionary vectors, you get existential risk, you get breakdown, and you get disease. It's actually that simple. Again, because it is the entelechy, the soul, that's the organizing principle. So if you separate the organizing principle or entelechy from the matter, you, you have degeneration. The soul has no way to express itself, not right. in this dimension. In the astral dimension, it's fine. You got a body of light, but we're right. not living in the astral dimension. We're here in 3D. We, plus we are time. here in 3D. And one of the ways to talk about the soul that I like, you know, I, I used to use the word soul a lot. I wrote this book, Soul Prince. And then because the word is, and I know it's it's a beautiful word and it's it's gorgeous that you use it, I I I shifted my my language and I began to talk about irreducible value. Yeah, you can do it that way. To me, soul means consciousness within. Soul is, soul is beautiful. Soul is gorgeous. And, and soul prince is, is gorgeous. And I love it. And in order to create a wider conversation, right, because we all have what I would call, Paul, with your permission, the eye of value. Yeah. Right? We all know that the good, the true, and the beautiful is real. Right? Absolutely. I mean, value is linked heavily to Jung's feeling function of consciousness. And we actually can feel value. Value lives inside of us. We all have what I call an anthro-ontological capacity. Without value, you can't make meaning. You can't make meaning. And we have this anthro-ontological capacity. It means anthro-human being. Ontolog ontological meaning we can directly see the real. We have yeah. direct access to the real. And we need to know that, that value lives in us. And what we've done is we've allowed fundamentalist religion to hijack value. Yes. And so we need to reclaim first principles. I like to call them, Paul, first principles and first values embedded in a story of value. And my friend, Zach Stein, and I were calling that cosmoerotic humanism. I love it. The new story of evolving value. And it's paradoxical that the orthodox religions hijack value, and so is scientism, the new religion hijacking value. Well, it's what's actually it's interesting, right? The old religions hijack value by saying we are the only people who know what value is. All the other religions are wrong, so they right. stepped out of the field of value in that way because they said it's only us, so they're not in the field. And then scientism hijacked value by reducing value to a social construct, which which basically meant there's no fucking shared fields of value. Which means there's no relationship, and therefore you're trying to kill love. Good fucking luck. It, meaning, let, 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 absolutely, and let's put it in maybe offer offer a, a way to say it. There's no intimacy. There's no intimacy. You got it. Bang on. In, intimacy is based on a you know a couple. Intimacy is based on a shared field of value. And we we might say together, Paul, is that we're facing a global intimacy disorder. We are. We have an autoimmune disorder going on. Yeah. And and. You know, the thing, too, I think is important is the intimacy that you're referring to is deeper than you can get with a penis entering a vagina or a tongue going into the mouth or even a baby coming through a birth canal. The intimacy yes. is the overlapping of my uniqueness with your uniqueness to create a third that is made of the two of us that carries the intelligence that you and I carry, the uniqueness that you and I carry, and becomes a gift to everybody that interacts with it. And that's, that's gorgeously said. In other words, right now, 
right? We're actually creating a, a new field of intimacy. We are. Because you've got this irreducibly unique gorgeousness, which is reality being Paul. Then you have reality being Mark. And in this space between us, I've never in my entire life experienced this unique space of intimacy. So what we've done is we've created a new intimacy. There's a new quality of intimacy. Now, let's think about this for a second. If we get that divinity, or let's even use the word God, let's say we realize God's not just the infinity of power, God's the infinity of intimacy. And yes. then Paul is God's unique intimacy. And so Mark, Mark, God's unique intimacy. Then when Paul and Mark meet, we create a new quality of intimacy, which means we're creating a new God. A new expression of it for sure. Right, right. And it's, it's literally a new quality of divinity. It right? is. Not a, not a new separate God in the kind of the sense of the Roman pantheon, but there's a new, in other words, what the interior science is new, and this is the most shocking radical understanding on the inside of the inside of interior science is that there's more God to come. There has to be, there always is, because you can only experience as much God as you can comprehend, feel, perceive, or understand. And yes, yes, yes. And when two fields come together and we create a new, so intimacy is shared identity. We have an intimacy equation in cosmorotic humanism. Intimacy equals shared identity in the context of otherness. So there's now shared identity between Paul and Mark, but in the context of otherness, irreducible uniqueness, times mutuality of recognition, we recognize each other, times mutuality of pathos, we feel each other, times mutuality of value, we're in a shared field of value, and finally, times mutuality of purpose, now we can have shared purpose together. Yes, and that's what's missing in the world. We don't have yes. a common dream anymore. We need... I tell people in podcast interviews, I said this on Brian Rose's uh, podcast with him, London Beautiful. Real. I said, look, you're worried about fucking COVID? That's a distraction. The real issue is we've killed the soils. We've killed the oceans. The animals are dying. The fish are dying. We've poisoned everything. The game board that allows us the lower white right quadrant in Ken Wilber Wilber's model, the collective exterior, is dying. And that's got to be our collective fucking dream now, right now. Yes, yes, yes. And why is it dying, brother? It's dying because we're not intimate with it. That's why I talked about the danger of transcending without including the archaic, the magic, and the mythical. Exactly. We have to be intimate with the archaic. So now we're getting somewhere. So in other words, we need to be intimate with the archaic. We've got to be intimate with the magic. And we've got to be intimate with the mythical. And we have to be intimate with Gaia, but intimate with Gaia means not the new age reduction, right? In which we regress and we reject the neocortex and we say, right? And that's not exactly right. The neocortex, neocortex emerges out of Gaia and it's a wonderful evolution. We don't want to regress. But we, want to, we want to have shared identity. I want to realize I don't exist without the plankton. I don't exist without the coral reef. Amen. Right? In other words, and that's without, I, I am nothing outside of the context of everything. Yes, look, how many people, how many people would don a hazmat suit and spray poisons all over their fucking dog that they love? But we've we've got to go from petting dogs and cats to taking care of flowers, bees, trees, birds, go microorganisms. I mean, we've gotten so smart, we've we're killing ourselves with you know, as Lao Tzu says, if you sharpen a knife too much it becomes dull. We've taken the mental concept which does not function the mental world is dimensions above this one yes when you import it into this dimension and it is allowing you to be distracted from what makes life here and now which is reality i define reality as what's happening right now gorgeous we, it, we you know mentalism is symbolism symbolisms point to something else we keep pointing to something other like a computer and forgetting that the dog hasn't been pet or loved and neither is your wife and your kids and they're now dying on fucking Game Boys and pornography sites. Right. Get back to your own body. Get back to loving your yard. Love your soil. Love the planet. Care about the lakes, the streams, the rivers, and the oceans because they are us. So gorgeous, which means, brother, I'm 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 so excited to be in this conversation because it's Me so too. critical and it's so and, and let's break this new ground here. When we when we understand that the root of the meta crisis is a 
what we're calling a global intimacy disorder. What we understand is that it's not enough to tell people, save the environment because you'll die. That actually won't work. As long as people can actually create a timeline in which they're not going to physically die, but someone else will, they'll avoid it. Love the environment so you can live. You've got to love the environment because you fell in love with it. I totally dig it. That I've got to act the way we save Gaia is because we've fallen in love with Gaia. We're actually intimate with Gaia. Gaia is part of our, we have a felt sense of pathos. We have a shared field of value. And we actually get that scientifically, all of the values of Gaia live in me. And AI is the fucking bypassing of all the values of Gaia for hypercomputation. That's the tragedy of AI. So that's what you're saying so beautifully. We've got to include and transcend, but that means we have to be intimate with all of the dimensions of our being. And the second we split off parts of ourself, we collapse and die. We do. We, 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 we become disabled. And isn't it interesting how part of the World Economic Forum's plan is to keep you out of nature? Yeah. You're not allowed to go into those trees. You're a threat to, the, to nature. You have to stay within our smart cities and our kill lights and all this other shit. This is a fucking digital prison from hell, and it's disconnecting us from the medicine that we are describing. It's a violation of intimacy. It's a violation of life itself. And evil is a violation of intimacy. Evil, in my language, is any act that is immoral. Immoral meaning life affirmative. Against life. Against evil, life. Evil is evil is live spelled backwards, right? It, it and, is. Yes. E evil stands against life. In other words, but the evil is evil because it violates the intimate universe. It does, and 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 it's devastating. It it it, it hurts my heart and my soul just talking about it. It, it does, and you know, and if, if every one of us listening now literally kind of figures out, okay, what part of myself is split off? What part of myself have I become not intimate with that I can reintegrate? What part of my dreams have I become non intimate with? Who in my circle have I cut off and become non intimate with? And non intimate means they're not part of my shared identity. I can't feel them anymore. They've become an object. Who in my family right, have I split off? And if literally 50,000 people listening now in this very second go and become intimate with a dimension that was split off, then the world begins to tilt on its axis. Let's do it. Absolutely. And you know, I can give you evidence of what we're talking about together here. Uh, I don't remember the psychologist. There's two of them. They wrote a book on nature deficit disorder. They were the two New York psychologists that first figured this out. They started taking kids with ADD, ADHD, behavioral problems, and other things, kind of the, all the problem children from school, they took them out for one day a week. I think it was for three hours at a time and just let them play in the forest and run around on trails and just do whatever they kind of wanted to do out there. And they found with as little as one three hour trip to nature a week, a huge percentage of these psychological disorders, ADD, ADHD, et cetera, behavioral problems started to just disappear. Yeah. And they, so what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that the children needed intimacy with the deeper self, what Jung, what Jung calls the capital S-E-L-F. That's right. And that gorgeous. And that's the, the intimacy. Intimacy is the key, right? Because all of that nature that the kids were visiting actually, and this is the key, this is where the way we need to reintegrate shamanism and science, that nature quite fucking literally lives inside of me. It does. Right? And, uh, and so... To actually split off from it in the exterior world is to actually live in denial of self. Yes. And to deny my essential nature causes me immense pain and causes the physiological, psychological, psychic, mental breakdown of self in the collective. And, and let's just put one more level on that. Yes, sir. What, what's happening now with the industrialization, which has been going on for a long time, the industrialization of our food supply, the mechanism of water delivery systems, the pollution of the air, and forcing people in lockdowns to be indoors away from the sun. 
we are a collection of cells that are constantly being replaced. Current science says we replace every cell in our body within one year. It used yes, to be sir. seven years. Now they say it's one year. That's right. So I describe the soul like a water fountain. And I say to my students, have you ever been to a park with a great big water fountain? And yeah. when you first got out of your car a hundred yards away, it looked like a white tree or a tree of ice. Yeah. But as you got closer to it, you realized it's moving. It's a living fountain. And the structure represents the human being. But what we have to remember is that depends on water, nature. It depends on natural food, nature. It depends on fresh air, nature. It depends on sunlight because that's what runs that pump and gives it form. And yeah. so as we've gotten into Franken foods and, and Bill Gates bullshit and chemicals, we aren't eating food anymore. We're not bringing nature into ourselves. The water we're drinking is dead, poisonous crap. We're killing that part of ourselves because we're doing it to nature. We're not bringing in fresh air. Our air is devitalized. Beautiful. The oxygen levels are low yes. and we're blocking in the sun with all these fucking chemtrails. So you see, gorgeous. We, we are nature manifesting itself in not only human form, but in all these other forms. But when you take these core aspects of nature that are carriers of life force and spirit that are all aspects of the soul and you denature them, you separate a person from the greater self and they begin to die just like a child taken away from its mother at birth. And then it begins to degenerate because it doesn't have connection to the bigger self of itself. So too, too gorgeous, right? And, and you know, and, and I'm using the word gorgeous a lot because you're saying a lot of gorgeous things, right? Thank so, you. Uh, I'm feeling gorgeous today. We're, we're, we're feeling gorgeous today. So two things that I think are just really critical here. So one is fucking revolution. And revolution means every act I do, right, to create a new intimacy, a new intimacy with the air, a new intimacy with water, a new intimacy with a split off part, a new intimacy with sunlight, a new intimacy with food, Right, and to actually find and, and access food and actually become intimate with the food I eat. Now, don't eat processed food that actually destroys you. Become intimate with what you're eating. So that's one. It's about reclaiming intimacy. We can only heal the global intimacy disorder by reclaiming as our revolutionary act deeper and higher intimacies in every dimension of our lives. And think about it. The prism that I want to bring to this is intimacy. It's a global intimacy disorder, but here's two. And this is the place where kind of new age fundamentalism's got in trouble. In other words, we can't deify nature by itself. Nature has to be within a larger ground of value. And we need to understand that there's an evolution of value. So in other words, we don't want to just go back to nature, right? The law of the jungle is sometimes painful, right? Lions can kill deers within the context of nature. But, you know, Paul, you'd be annoyed if I ate you for dinner, right? So in other words, right? Well, it depends. Okay, we got to think about that, right? But okay, right, well, That's where you started, well, I guess. Right, right. That's, a bit, that's, a, that's a bigger conversation, right? Yeah. So, right? But, yeah. but, right? but, but the, the- Well, let the imagination be handling that one. Exactly, right? So, I mean, but, but the idea is, is that actually there's an evolution of value and that value gets deeper and wider and higher- and the field of nature is the beginning of the field of value. But actually, as we actually evolve into humanity and into a neocortex, we have the ability to access wider and wider fields of value. So what we need to do is we need to weave together the field of human value, the ability to write Shakespeare, right, to actually create the depth of a marriage that's done shadow work, which, yes. which actually is not accessible right, in nature before human beings. Right. We need to bring those two together and avoid, as I know that you do, avoid kind of fundamentalist new age claims for a return to nature, which is a pre-modern, right, inappropriate regression. We need an evolutionary shamanism. We need an evolutionary vision of nature in which soul in nature and value in nature actually yeah. become a larger whole. That's the new eros. Hi, everybody. One of my favorite Symbiotica products, which I love to use when you got two kids in the house that bring home all sorts of stuff from school and have runny noses and coughs like kids often do. So if I need a little backup, I get out my Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C 
tastes great, feels great. I use it regularly, and it's just a good backup plan to support your immune system. But better yet, I've got Shervine, the creator of the product, right here to tell us more about it. So Shervine, what's unique about your liposomal vitamin C? Well, this has evolved over the years. This is our ninth iteration, and this is coming from fermented cassava, mm. not coming from corn. And it's in liposomal form, and we also have added compounds in there, including biotin and potassium bicarbonate, which is a very highly absorbing form of potassium. This right here is delicious. It is delicious. Okay? You know, we're using organic vanilla and organic extracts and citrus bioflavonoids, and you're getting a thousand milligrams of fermented vitamin C in liposomal form. So we're talking about pure absorption. So if you're, you know, you got the everyday cold or you're feeling the chills or you just need a boost in your immune system, boom, you can hit that right there. It's good for children. It's good for, you know, elderly. Anyone can have it. And it is one of my favorite products. Or if you're going to go on an airplane or being around a lot of people that aren't healthy and you just want a little immune backup or immune boost. Absolutely. That's delicious, Mm. high absorbing, and gets to the subcellular level almost immediately. And kids love it. Kids love it. I haven't met anyone that doesn't like the flavor. It's beautiful. Yeah. So to get your Living 4D discount, go to symbiotica.com. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. To get your 15% discount on checkout, use the code capital L, number four, capital D, 15. Enjoy your Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. In essence, what you're saying is there's no turning back from technology and to go back to living in tents and campfires uh, won't work. And it won't work. I I think we just need to rekindle our awareness of understanding of love of an appreciation and value for nature and become conscious enough to limit technologies that destroy the infrastructure that lead to those values so that we can you know the same fucking technology we've used to destroy the planet could be used to heal it and let's say two things and that's really important one technology is not a tool anymore technology is not value neutral right? Technology actually is encoded with value. So the techplex, so people say the techplex, what's the problem? It's, it's just a tool. It depends on how you use it. That's no longer true. And that's what you're pointing towards. Technology today is an immersive environment that intentionally encodes values that are often destructive of person and value. That's number one. Number two, the second thing you say is, is that actually, but if we actually found the spark of technology, which is sacred and beautiful, we actually need to access technology as a key part of actually manifesting the most beautiful world that needs to be manifested. And do you, you know that movie Avatar that's around as we're talking? Yeah. Uh-huh. So here's the tragedy of Avatar 1 and Avatar 2, without going into the details of the movie, but basically sets up this conflict between this avarice, greed, profit-driven earth that's driven by exponential technologies and the beautiful Navi people who are deeply integrated, you know, in their bodies, you know, in their femininity and masculinity, deeply integrated in the fields of nature. But what Avatar never does, and what our dear friend James Cameron never does, is he never integrates the two worlds. And so he leaves it as a polarization. What we actually need to do is, is actually move beyond the polarization of the technology people and the nature people and actually create a new whole, which is technology and nature merged together into a new eros. That's the third. That's the third. We need to to become conscious of the third. That's right. And we need to have the right ingredients in the third so that the third doesn't just become another distortion of some kind, which, which means it has to be guided by values. It has to be guided by a new vision of value that is a vision of evolving value. And as you know so well, you know, Paul, and that's where your podcast is so unique, but in the kind of vector of public culture, you've got in a certain sense a techno utopian set of podcasts. We'll call those the Bill Gates podcasts. <laughs> then you, you have a whole other vector of podcasts that are kind of anti technology return to nature, right? But actually, there's a polarization between them. And the most serious existential risk in the world today is polarization. Yes, it is. And we need to move beyond polarization. And that's why it's always important to me to say, no, no, Harari's not motivated by kind of greed. He's motivated. He's misguided. I think wildly destructive, but he's motivated, right, by a desire, right, to actually do something good. But he's 
obliterated the fields of value, right? The tech, right? The, the, the back to nature people are not just, you know, Luddite and anti-technology. They're actually sensing something of inherent value and the sacred in nature. And I want to always find what on both sides actually has a spark of the sacred. Let's honor the values on both sides, bring them together into a larger whole, because otherwise we just remain part of the polarization. Yes, and all polarizations um, limit view. Yes, yes, they limit brother. view. You see, yes, your, your 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 menu gets smaller and smaller. Therefore, your options for change and creativity reflect the the limitation of view and vision. Right, right, and I'm and I'm going to say something radical here with your permission. Oh, right. So, so even in the vaccine issue. Right? Yeah. And the, right, even in the vaccine issue, and there's an enormous amount of information that's come out in the last year, which has validated the critique of the COVID vaccine on multiple vectors. You've talked about it in many podcasts, and I, I'm taking that as a given because I'm, I'm, I'm starting from there. However, not all of the people who were in favor of the vaccine are just wild greed people, you know, at a particular pharmaceutical company. You know, I know myself three excellent internists who are actually still arguing for forms of the vaccine. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. What I'm saying is we have to steel man both positions, actually see are there value in both positions and have direct face-to-face conversations of Eros. And here's the tragedy. When was the last time, Paul, that you saw on a panel three intelligent, beautiful people who were radically correctly opposing the vaccine and three people who were not from the Fauci vector, but who were actually serious healers who had come to a conclusion that actually said the vaccine may be important in certain vectors. When have we seen on a national television program, those six people on the same program honoring each other and having a conversation in which they actually confronted each other and worked to create a larger whole? You and I both know that conversation has not happened. No, and I can I can tell you my opinion on why. Take it away, because sir. Because most of the people that are pro-vaccine that would need to be on the panel don't want to risk losing a debate or a discussion and minimizing their position or having to face the shadow of their own position. And maybe it's the same on both sides. I don't know. That's one. That's one of the reasons. But the second reason is, is that actually... The, the establishments for which they work would actually fire them. In other Absolutely. Words, in, in other words, but I just want to be really clear here because it, it, my, my deep, deep knowing, brother, is, right, is that actually polarization is the single greatest challenge we face. And when I talk to people who are in the CNN New York Times bubble, you cannot get them to see beyond it. But when I talk to people who are in a certain kind of podcast alternative information source bubble, right, they're, they're kind of in wild demonizations of everyone. And it's actually much more, there is greed. There is malevolence. There is organized malevolence. That's actually true. And there's also an enormous amount of ignorance. And what we have to do is we have to stand for eros and love, which means we have to actually be willing to steal me on both sides, steal me on, steal me on the values on both sides. You know, I'm going to tell you something wild. You know that Dick Nixon and John Kennedy were good friends. Isn't that wild? Uh, that, that is very interesting. That's kind of a polarization of friends. Right, right. In other words, and today, they could never be friends, right? Because they actually realized that that which united them was so much greater than that which divided them. And we need to come back to a shared field of value where we stand and we can argue vociferously but not demonizing the other side. And that, my friend, is exactly why I said we've got to get back to the game board because life depends on earth, water, fire, and air. And we have to say we must use technology to to protect nature, to protect the cleanliness of the water for all living beings and to keep the soils healthy Yes, and keep the air healthy because the debate cannot go on. And keep our hearts healthy and keep our souls healthy. Right. But the the, the discussion can't go on yes. if the game board goes away because we all have that in common. I don't care who you are or where you're from. If you're human and you're on this earth, you are dependent upon yes. those elements and the management, the mix, the marriage and the utilization of them. And if your concept 
is yeah. ignorant of the primacy of that, then you are distorted to a degree that makes you dangerous to everybody. You're actually in denial of yourself because actually that game board, as you put it, or that field of exteriors, the plankton and the oceans, yes. right, right, and, right, and the biosphere, that's actually part of your identity. It is. And as that our part of our identity has denatured due to largely human influence, so has our psychology. That's right. So has our spirituality. We have soul sickness because I, I, I'm going to share a concept with you. Please, brother. I developed a concept called the ECHO, E-C-H-O. It's an mm -hmm. acronym, energy, chemistry, mm -hmm. hydration, organisms. Beautiful. Whatever we do that influences the energy, chemistry, quality of the water and capacity for real hydration and the nature of the organisms in our environment, we do to ourselves. The pendulum swings. We inflict something on nature, it inflicts something back on us. You poison the soil, you eat from the poison. You yeah. poison the water, you poison your body. You poison the air, you breathe it. So we've got to understand that the fundamental level, there's an echo chamber going on. Gorgeous. But we are obliterating nature's natural healing capacity. Look, Chernobyl's a great example. 20 yeah. years after Chernobyl, scientists went back, evaluated for radiation, chemistry, and everything, and they said, this is one of the cleanest places on the world now. How did that happen? The environment healed itself, and all you had to do is get human beings the fuck out of the way. We have got to... We don't have to get ourselves out of the way. We got to get ourselves back into our hearts and back into common sense and back into a realization that technology without shamanism, which is just to say nature worship, is dangerous. So, so this, this is a big deal. And, and you say it beautifully. We need shamanism and technology. And to say it a different way, we need value in technology. In other words, we need to down, download outrage. We live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Outrageous love, though, is not a social construct. It's the eros of cosmos that animates all of reality. We have to download value and download evolutionary love, outrageous love, into the technological press and plex so that it's animated by eros, that eros suffuses it, and it suffuses eros. And we need to allow, yes, nature to work its magic and to recognize that nature is filled with value choices, right? It's filled with the value of beauty and the value of amazement, and the value of wonder. And if we don't reclaim value, brother, then we'll never reclaim nature. And, and I'm going to set us up for the next discussion. Take, take it away, sir. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's rock this. Hallelujah. It's it is belief yeah. that forms values. Mm. And mm. belief is a product of one's myth, whether it's conscious or unconscious. That's why I started with the Imago Dei and the myth. James Carr says a myth is a story that tells itself. And the story that's telling us is Mother Nature in the physical exterior form. If you are a shaman, then you know that there's an interior to nature called the soul of nature or the soul of the world or what mm -hmm. Plotinus referred to as the world soul, but he was referring to the whole universe. But it's right. the soul. You can't have nature here without the sun, without the moon, without the stars. So people's ideas have become so circumscribed and so narrow that their only sense of value is, do I have enough money to get a new Game Boy or a... Uh, you know, my next iPhone or the coolest car or whatever without any awareness of what the cost of that is. I, I once saw a program on a documentary. It was actually a TED show. And this girl did something mind boggling. She showed what it takes from nature to make, I think it was a laptop computer or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And it mm -hmm. included insects. It included pigs. It included nuts. I mean, it was fucking mind-blowing you're like wow right. she just showed you the cost right. to nature to make a computer right the energy and it was, the, it, the energy cost not only the energy but the resources the like energy the resources the extraction the whole thing yes and and recent evidence 
scientists have found that we're extracting from nature at a rate of 1.75 times, 1.75 times its capacity to regenerate. You don't need to be very smart to figure out that's a death stroke. David right. Suzuki in about 2000, that you know David Suzuki? Yes. He did a presentation on Canadian television. I just happened to catch it. I was on the road and it was by the grace of God that I did. He took a Petri dish and he put bacteria in it and he used the bacteria to model the human population at the size that it was at. Right. And then he put a food supply in and he set it up so that the food supply represented how much nature can produce and the bacteria represent how much we're consuming. And then he just watched them annihilate themselves. So, so how do we, right. No, so t take it away. But I want to, I want, I know you, you want to go someplace with an inquiry, so I don't want to jump in. No, if you want to say something, do man, this is so fun. I can't have, stop having fun. It's beyond, it's beyond fun, but the highest, deepest level of joy, right? It's deep yes, joy because it's we get joy to talk because about it's love and honesty. Total, total. And it's so, so let's just, this is, it's why I keep coming back to value. Yes. You see, even the notion that we have to save the future generations is a value. Totally. Without, without having a field of value, there's no good reason to save the future generations. So if we don't reclaim a story of value, yes, which is not based on subjective beliefs, but it's on a shared field of value. And this is, this is why the way with permission, you know, in this Da Vinci moment, what we're trying to do is articulate, Paul, right? The notion that reality is based on first principles and first values. Yes. That there are intrinsic first principles and first values of reality that are actually grounded in cosmos itself. Now, here's something completely wild. If you look up on the new Open Chat AI, which is the new program, and you ask it, which I just did, is value real? What it responds is values a subjective concept based on what any individual person ascribes right to an individual situation or object or relationship. And then it says, and value is not an objective property of anything. So this is AI making an oracular proclamation, right? That value is not real. In other words, what I cited earlier in our podcast as Harari or Schwab being a parrot of the modern postmodern deconstruction of value has now been adopted by OpenAI as the position, the official position of the Oracle. Value's not real. And so what we have to do is we have to actually figure out where did value go wrong and how do we actually reclaim value and actually articulate a story of value rooted in first principles and first values. So what we're trying to do now in cosmorotic humanism is to articulate, okay, what are the 20 core values of cosmos? How do we identify them? How do we show that they go all the way down to matter and all the way up through life and through mind, that they're evolving values? And how do we create a shared grammar of value? Because if we don't have a shared grammar of value, let's try and say it this way together. Every global problem, right? Every challenge, every existential risk is global, right? Fair? Global. Yep. You can't solve a global challenge without global coordination. No. You can't have global coordination without global resonance. You got to right. resonate. You can't have global resonance without global intimacy, right? Yeah. And you can't have global intimacy without a shared story of value. Right. And, and so the prime value of all this is love. The prime value is that, right, that eros is a value. And, and we need to say, okay, what is love? Right. So then I asked, then I asked the AI, is love real? That was my next thing, my next question. Good question. And, and the AI's response was, of course, not yes. It basically said, love means different things to different people. It's subjective, et cetera. So it completely ducked the issue. So we can't just use the word love. We have to say, okay, what do we mean when we say, and I use, I like the word eros, right? Eros is the fundamental value of cosmos. So I'm, I'm, I'll give you an example why, why we need to go deeper and, and not just use the word love. As you know, you and I talked about this before. We need to we need to posit what does love mean and what does eros mean. So I'll just give you an example. The classical the, the classical destruction of love in the contemporary academy runs something like as follows: fifteen hundred years ago, love meant X. Today, love means Y. Right, those are completely different. So, fifteen hundred years ago, if your wife was disobedient and you were a patriarch in China, 
you slapped her five times because you were loving. You didn't break her arm because you were loving, right? Today, if you slap your wife appropriately, you should fucking go to jail because you're you're a fucking asshole, right? Yeah. Right now, so the postmodernists and lots of the modernists say, well, how can you say love is real? We're using the word love to talk about that Chinese patriarch. We're using the same word love today. The word love doesn't mean anything. It's just a social construction. That's wrong. That's wrong. But we, we have to know how to reject that argument. There's a fundamental problem with the argument. Go ahead. This is what happens when you become too logical and too rational at the expense of the unrational and the feeling nature. You, you know, life is not just sentences and life is not just numbers and life Absolutely. is not just math. God is a dancer. So let's together devastate that argument. Take it away. You go first. Let's devastate that argument because we have to devastate. I'm just simply saying that a lot of the issues of the world right now look very rational to a lot of people, but they have excluded the unrational because the unrational is the subjective aspect of human consciousness. It's, totally. the, it's, the, it's the essence of the soul. The soul's not a mathematician. The soul feels. I would say the universe feels and the universe feels love. Yes. And so what I want to put on the table right now is if all of us, before we throw a cigarette out the window or before we buy more Roundup for our garden and poison the shit out of everything, and before we fund corporations like processed food manufacturers and drug companies that are poisoning everybody and killing people faster than most diseases, we should ask this fundamental question before we make any choice as often as we can. Absolutely. What would love do now? And we have to show yes, 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 yes. No but, just a yes. And we have to show that this argument of the academy that says that love's not real because its shape changes is actually wrong. And the it's reason totally it's wrong. wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because the eternal Tao the field of value. The Tao is the field of value. The eternal Tao is the evolving Tao. That is yes. to say, love is real and love evolves. It does. And the story of the evolution of consciousness is the story of the evolution of love. So although love evolves, right, what love always means is that I'm doing the best that I know how to nurture and to take care and to hold those that are precious to me. Now, as love evolves, we deepen the way I nurture. We deepen the way I take care. And we also expand the circle of those who are precious to me. Exactly. Early on, those who are precious are just my family or my clan. And then it becomes my kingdom. Then it becomes all human beings. Then it becomes all human beings and animals. Then it becomes all human beings, animals, right? And the earth itself. So we, we love is the evolution of love. And what the postmodernists think is because we show that love changes, value is not real. That's not true. Value is not eternal and unchanging. Value is intrinsic and real and evolving. I can give you an example of how value evolves. Yes. When I, when I was a 30-year-old athlete, my value was you go to the gym, you spend 90 minutes in there, you kick some freaking ass and you don't complain or you're just a pussy. All right. But now at 61, I go in the gym and I go, what do I feel like doing today and what would be best for my body? <laughs> and, and in both cases, you're actually honoring the call of value of your body, but your body's value has evolved. But the value of the body and being embodied, right, and exercising and working the body and inhabiting the body, right, remains. But how you engage that body has evolved, but the core value of body remains. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. When I was 22 and I joined the 82nd Airborne Division, Not my then. value was, that was right when the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was literally on the runway, parachute, weapon loaded, heading for Grenada, right when they called the, the battle off, so I didn't have to go. But I literally was on the, on the runway, walking toward an aircraft to go. Wow. All the whole boxing team was already in Grenada. They were already on the ground uh, in combat. Right. And so the point I'm making is when I joined the military, I joined it because my values said we are being attacked by an enemy. But after two years 
in the military, in the 82nd Airborne Division, I did a year of electronics training and basic training and jump school. Right. But by the time I had was in my last year of my first term in the 82nd, I said, wait a minute. I don't know anything about the enemy. I don't right. know what's true. I only know what I'm being told by people that have an agenda. And it is against my heart and soul to kill somebody when I don't know for sure what the truth is. So Gorgeous. from the age of 23 to 25, my values evolved. That's right. So your original value, but, and let's, let's track this. This is really beautiful because this actually solves value theory. Right. And it's really, really, really crazy important. And everyone listening, this is not theoretical. This is so practical in our lives. So Paul starts out with the value of let me protect goodness. Let yes. me protect my people. Let me protect the good values of America. Baseball, free choice, apple pie, motivation, working hard. The right. Dream. And then and the dream. And then the other, right, that we were attacking, those became those who opposed that value. And as Paul's heart evolves, as his mind evolves, he says, oh, I want to protect those same values, but maybe those other people are included in them. Maybe they're precious to me as well. So and maybe does, they think we're threatening their values. So it doesn't mean that love has disappeared as a real value. It means that who's included in your circle of love and how you love them has expanded, intensified, and deepened. Yes. This is, this is wildly important. And one of the definitions I give of spirituality yes, is sir. a progressively expanding sphere of relationship. That's gorgeous. In other words, spirituality is evolution, brother. And evolution, it is. Evolution is the progressive deepening of intimacies. It is. And when you're deepening- Hot damn. Yeah. When you deepen your intimacy to the point, like I'll, t I'll give you an example. Take it away, sir. I'm friends with some very elite soldiers. I've known Delta Force guys. I've I've know I I'm somebody that knows people in all the most elite military organizations. Why? Because I was an elite trainer of athletes and extremely successful. And many of them came to me specifically for conditioning. That makes sense. And I asked them as I woke up to everything I've been describing to you. I said, "Doesn't it?" ever make you wonder if the people you're killing deserve to die? How yeah. do you know that what you're doing is moral and just? Right. You know what the most common answer I got from elite soldiers is? Was, yeah. Paul, I don't give a shit. I just love to hunt and kill and I get paid to do it. I don't want to even fucking ask that question or I will lose my fun. So there you see a level of psychological development that's really yeah. quite I don't need paleolithic. It's not even a fair word to use. It's an insult to paleolithic. What it is, it's a, it, it makes life a competitive sport. Right. In which the other doesn't exist. Exactly. You turn the other into an object. And it's interesting. I learned this from Keith Witt. He said, having studied native languages, that it, I don't remember the time period, but it wasn't that long ago. He said native tribes did not have a word for people outside of their tribe. So anybody that threatened their tribe was not perceived as a human. They were perceived as an object, so they had no problem killing them. No, that, that's exactly, I mean, Buber talks, it, it's completely beautifully he says, see, everyone agreed that you cannot murder, but everyone said you can't murder human beings and people out of my tribe aren't human beings. Right. And isn't it funny? One of the 10 commandments is thou shalt not kill, but we kill like motherfuckers all day long. So evolution has to be the evolution of intimacy. It so, does. So, so you and I, I mean, we're launching here today, the intimacy revolution. I've, right? I'm, I'm in it, man. I'm giving I'm you a big hug and a kiss right oh now. Oh my God. Like total, right? Intimacy yeah, revolution. I don't care what your sex is. Your love I, is I, I am in. I am in with you, brother, right? In yeah. other and it means, it means in the intimacy revolution, we get to be excited about each other's story. We do. Right? And, and what are we without them? Who is Mark? You know, let me post a question to you. This is what I say to my students. Yes, sir. I say, okay, let me show you something about who you think you really are. If I could use a quantum supercomputer and download every single thought in Mark Gaffney's mind that he right. thinks is of his own self-creation and analyze and track it back to its source, 
what percentage of who Mark thinks he is would actually be made of everybody else? So that, and that's part one, which is yeah. absolutely right. I'm, 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 I'm a sum expression and integration of all these influences, and I want to receive them with mad love and delight. And, and, and then there's a dimension of Paul that's also radically original, irreducibly unique. His face is unlike any other, and Paul has a unique gift to give to reality that no one that ever was, is, or will be can give other than Paul. And therefore, when I meet Paul, I don't say to myself, why am I not Paul Check? That's not my story. My story was not to be in the 82nd Airborne. My story was not to do the brilliant work that Paul's done in medicine and health. My, my job was not to do the spiritual teaching in the way that Paul did. That was Paul's job. So I get to meet Paul and fall in love with him. Exactly. And, 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 and this, and isn't that just the, 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 the beautiful, right. The beautiful, intimate sharing of all of us. It's two pieces. It's intimacy. It's shared identity. We can feel each other, but there's a second piece to it, which is I love you. I need you. See, when you really love someone, you actually realize that you need them, but not in the kind of codependent degraded, pathologized, No, right? but actually, we actually realize, oh, in this intimacy revolution, right? If Paul's not there, we're going to be missing something so essential. And so when I see Paul and I get ecstatically excited about reality, having a Paul experience and about this chapter in the universe, a love story, which is Paul, I say, oh my God, I need this guy. And I can't do it without him. And then I'm wildly excited because if I can't say I need you with full vulnerability and an open heart, then I don't really love you. Then you're just an object, right, in my play. Yes. And if we saw each other as a mystery worthy of exploring, like, see, to yes. me, who Mark really is is a mystery, maybe even to himself, right? Yeah. But when I meet Mark, and I get to experience the magic and the mystery and the wisdom and the intelligence and the life experience. It's as though I've entered into a new adventure. Yeah. And I, as much as I think I know, look, you've been married. I've been married to Penny for 26 years. The most dangerous thing you can do in a marriage is think you actually know your partner because that's the day that you stop paying attention. That's, no, that's that's so gorgeous, right? Because love is at its core, not at its core, its source. It's not an emotion. Love's a perception. It's a perception. It's a feeling. It's, it's a feeling, an energy. It's spirit, right? It's all of that. And I want to actually know that I have the privilege of feeling the infinitely unfolding mystery that is reality having a Paul experience. And I want to never stop being curious in the second that I place Paul in a box. Yeah. And I think I've got him worked out, right? Which is a data set. Which is a data set, and which is also, you know, it's a funny thing, right? One of the things that people used to do in the, in the, in the old world of 500 years ago, when they didn't understand someone, they called them a witch. Yeah, exactly. Right? And then they burned them at the stake. Yeah. Right. The modern psychological, that was when we had priests. We've now moved from priests to psychologists. So we're not going to call someone a witch. We'll call them a sociopath. We'll right. reduce them to some label, right? We'll ignore what all our, our ulterior projection agendas are, and we'll stop being in devotion to their mystery. Yeah. And that's a very big deal. And I'm not saying that there's not people that need to be confronted, you know, because of, of reasons that sometimes people need to be confronted. But generally, right, I need to be in radical devotion before the altar of the mystery of the beloved. And the yeah. beloved is everyone. There's no strangers. No, they're, they're, otherwise the beloved doesn't exist. That's right. There are no strangers, my friend, right? Yeah. And we have to keep expanding the boundary, right? And that boundary got to expand and expand until we go from egocentric, just me and my people, to ethnocentric, me and my tribe, right? Until my tribe expands to all human beings, world-centric, until I actually become cosmocentric, all human beings and all of planet Earth. And then, Paul, we got to go intergalactic. Yeah, we got to transcend. It's not just planet Earth. We can't just be ethno-human. No, 
Because otherwise we're going to have galactic wars and we're actually at a space where we actually understand that extraterrestrial and extra dimensional is actually a scientific reality that we have to take very seriously as a we do possibility. <laughs> and as a shaman, I can tell you they're very real. <laughs> they're re and so therefore we need to say what unites us with the intergalactic world, Eros. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wondered why your blood is red? It's because it's full of oxygen and life force. It's what keeps you going. But what if I could tell you about something else that's red that will add more life force and keep you going? And if you start with a red juice before you have coffee or tea and wait a few minutes, you might find that you either don't need the coffee or the tea or you need less of it. But this time, instead of getting coffee and tea, you got a lot of nutrition and a lot of great stuff for stress management and detoxification. And it's so important. I got Drew Canoli. It took me two years to get him to come <laughs> hang out with me and talk about this. I said, Drew, tell me more about your red juice. And he is right here to tell us what is on with your red juice. My kids love it. Everybody I know loves it. Well, I love that we have it for kids. Because yes. when I was a kid, there was this big red dude that would burst through a brick wall. And he was like, oh, yeah. And he would <gasps> feed me a glass of 50 grams of sugar, <laughs> giving most people diabetes, yeah. ADHD, yeah. addiction. Obesity. Obesity. All the things, right? Mm -hmm. So when we created Red, it was, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. If we could create something that could create lasting stamina, lasting energy. And then we started to look at our ancient ancestors. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Vikings, mm -hmm. the people that were rowing across the oceans, oceans. for days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to go to war. Yeah. What were they taking? Well, they were taking rhodiola. Yeah. Rhodiola is in our red juice. Yeah. And then we were like, okay, so out of all the mushrooms, yeah. what's one of the best medicinal mushrooms that can give us long lasting energy? Mm. We found cordyceps. Cordyceps mm. are absolutely amazing. Yes. Not just any cordyceps or rhodiola, glyphosate residue free and organic. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it taste better then the, oh yeah, you yeah. know, how do we make it taste better than that without the sugar? Yeah. We added a little monk fruit. Monk we, fruit's amazing. Yep. And we found the best berries on the planet. Mm. Berries in, in high amounts, which we have in the red juice, actually help increase stem cell creation in your body. Mm. What's better than that for our little ones and for us? Yes. And so many people are just lethargic. They're lacking energy. Yes. What could we do for that? Red juice in the afternoon, 2 p.m. rolls around instead of a nap, instead of the coffee. Drink the red juice. You're going to feel so much better. Well, if you need the nap, take the nap if you can, but then take the red juice to kick you back into gear. Exactly. I love naps and yeah. I love coffee. I, I do too, but I love to make sure I got the nutrition in me first. You know, the other thing is berries are a natural stimulant to the adrenal glands. So mm. if people would do a little red juice before they do coffee and tea, they would pick themselves up naturally, except this time they're bringing in nutrition. And unfortunately, coffee blocks almost every vitamin and mineral you can put in your mouth. So Hey, there you have it, right from the man himself. If you're ready to get red with life force energy and vitality, go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And to make it even better, use the code C-H-E-K-20, all caps, to get your 20% discount on checkout because you're a living 4D badass and we want you healthy. I love you. Bye-bye. I need to get your help because... Please, brother. You're, you're using the word eros almost exclusively, but I feel that we need the feminine agape relationship. Can you bring agape into this so it's not so Cupid-oriented? Totally. Well, I, that's not... I mean, let's go back to eros and agape. So that's, I'm reading eros, as you noted in the beginning, in a very different way than the Greek split. Yeah, I, because we're talking to people that don't have your depth of understanding, your lexicon. So sure. No, I love that. I love that. I love I, that. I, I want to hear the feminine from you. No, the eros is completely feminine. In your language. That's why I need I need you to put totally, the, brother. bring totally, us up brother. onto to the... Received. So we're all speaking the same language. Received, received. So eros is, right? Eros has two qualities. One quality of eros is the experience of radical aliveness seeking, desiring ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. That's, a, that's an eros equation. Eros equals the experience of radical aliveness that's always seeking, desiring, moving towards ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness. That's one dimension of eros. The other dimension of eros is that quality of reality 
that is receiving the influx of reality. It's receiving the contact, taking the contact in and generating from it ever greater wholeness. So agape is not feminine. Agape is right the dimension of service to other, which is actually an expression of eros itself. The split between eros and agape said, I mean, I'm going to give you an example. Let's make this super crazy real, okay? There was a Super Bowl commercial a couple of years ago in which you had, you know, this halftime show with Shakira and another singer whose name escapes me right now who were kind of brilliant, radically, you know, erotic in the classical erotic sense of the term. Then you had a commercial and the commercial was for an insurance company. <laughs> and, the, and the commercial said, you know, the Greeks told us there are many kinds of love. And then it said, you know, eros is the uncontrollable urge, but agape is the highest, most abrupt form of love. And what they showed in agape was the picture they showed. So in eros, they showed a, a woman in a bikini and a man coming towards each other in a swimming pool. That was eros. And for agape, you saw an elderly person in a bathtub with someone bathing them. Right. Now, now stay close for a second. Because we've split eros and agape, the only people that bathe old people in bathtubs are orderlies that we pay $7 an hour. Right. In other words, we've lost the eros, the beauty, the aliveness of bathing an old yes. person. We've exiled that to agape. Yeah. Well, well, the people in the bathing suit, right, we pay shitloads of money to watch them. Yeah. We actually need to, <laughs> right? We how need fucked to, up is that? How fucked up is that? And we literally, we pay people 10 bucks an hour, right, to bathe old people because we actually don't value it. We actually have to re-eroticize agape. We got to stop the false split between eros and agape. It's all eros. It's all devotion. It's all service. There is no desire without devotion. You give a description of Eros that this just I found shockingly profound and beautiful, and I don't I, I don't know exactly the words, but you talked about Eros as a penetration into novelty to create something new is the way I that's heard right. it. Right? Can you right. can you describe that because that's yeah. such a, an amazing concept? No, it's 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 gorgeous, and actually, both the interior sciences of old. And some some new thinkers like Whitehead, right, both talk about eros in two ways. One is the creative advance of novelty, right, in which actually the force of creativity penetrates reality and to generate a new emergent. I love and that. The, and at the same time, there's the radical receptivity because that force of reality has to receive everything that came before, has to take it in, and then to thrust forward. And then the new moment has to receive that thrust in order to generate a new possibility. Yes. Right? That, is, that is the Eros of Cosmos. The Eros of Cosmos is the line is always penetrating the circle. The circle is always receiving the line. And what's generated is more value, more goodness, more truth, and more beauty. That's the quality of Eros that lives all the way up and all the way down. And when the Greeks split Eros and Agape, yeah. you, you get orderlies getting paid 10 bucks an hour, right? In order well, at to least they got a people. pay raise. <laughs> at least they got, they got a pay raise, right? And, and, <laughs> right, right. Oh my God. Can three I Three bucks you, an hour. <laughs> three bucks. You're right. They just got three bucks an hour. Can I tell you something wild, brother? When yeah. I was, when I was a, um, a rabbi, you know, I, I began my, 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 my life, you know, in deep in the Orthodox world. And I served as an Orthodox rabbi for a, a period of time. And, and, and it was an enormously beautiful time. And that's a, that's a larger story. But one of the first things I did when I, I started a, or participated in starting the next phase of a synagogue at that time is we, we created what was called the Holy Society, the Sacred Society, which was a burial society in which we would wash the bodies, right, of people who had passed away and then dress them. Mm. And, and I cannot imagine a more sacred moment yeah. Right. Then actually having a person whose body has just, the life has just left, they're on their journey of continuity of consciousness, and you're actually bathing the body. Right. So can you imagine if there's that level of sacredness in bathing a body that's passed, the sacredness in bathing an old person? We should pay people a thousand dollars an hour, right, in order to have the privilege of bathing an old person. 
And that's only going to happen if we understand that that is dripping and pulsing and throbbing with Eros. It's not mere agape. Yeah, it's a it's a great um, restructuring of a concept that yeah. um, it's almost as though you took the oxygen and the hydrogen apart and we lost the wetness of love. That's right. We lost the tumescence, the wetness, the dripping right yeah. of love. And you know, in reality, brother, reality is desire all the way up and all the way down. Oh, totally. Yes, I describe love. L in my system stands for life, which is desire. Life wants to live. That's right. O is unconditional love, pure potential. VE represents volt electron, which is the symbol for will. (laughs) Beautiful. So in my model that I teach my students, love symbolizes desire expressing itself as will. And will leads to an exploration, which must have desire to complete itself and to fulfill itself. I love it. I love it. So just support your beautiful teaching, brother. The Hebrew word for will is desire. The word is Uh, ratzon, R-A-T-Z-O-N, ratzon. It comes from the second couple, like the the first chapter, second verse of the Song of Solomon, which is the erotic love song of Solomon. And the verse is, mashcheni acharecha, seduce me, draw me after you, Narutsa, I will run towards you with my full will and desire. So the description of will is actually that moment in sexuality when you give up your small self, your small will, and this larger will steps in and you identify with that larger will and you are in. Now, we're afraid of that moment because we think it stands against ethics. Right, we think that we, we think that there's this opposition between desire, which is going to get in the way and destroy you, and ethics, which is goodness, meaning eros and agape. It's the same split. But actually, when you clarify your desire, you actually access your deepest heart's desire. Your deepest heart's desire, brother, is the desire of evolution itself awake and alive in you. Yes. It's, it's the unfolding of the mystery of your own myth. One beat at a time. And your myth is part of the great myth of cosmos. It's not separate. Yes. God's myth is a story of myriads of myths. Gorgeous. And each one is more God to come. And an analogy that I want to share with you, because I think you might find it interesting is The way I break it down simply for my students, I say, okay, if you want to understand how love works, just think of a jet engine. The front end that sucks is desire. The back end that blows is will. And the harder it sucks, the harder it blows every time. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Meaning desire turns itself into will. Just like the saying, what is God? Zero with a twist. Infinity. You take desire twist it, you get will. You take will, it's like a it's like a Mobius strip. One becomes the other instantly and perpetually. And will, as you say, so that was gorgeous, right? And let's just notice something, right, Paul, you're not using the word sucks and blows just to be provocative. No, no, no. I'm talking about I'm I'm using double bottom metaphors. Well, that's right. You're using double bottom metaphors, but what you're trying to say so I think elegantly and beautifully is, is that actually when you let me say it this way. Sex is love in the body. It is. Right? Sex is love in the body. In other words, that doesn't mean that you don't have to clarify desire. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be with the right person at the right time. You do have to clarify desire. Of course, you need to distinguish between surface desire and depth desire. I'm taking that as a given. But at its core, when I'm in the act of sexing and I'm in the right place with the right person at the right time, I'm in full devotion. Yes. And actually, there's not less of me. There's both more of me than there ever was. Yes. Right? I'm more present than there ever was. I'm both completely disappeared in my small self and my true self, which is my lover, is actually fully appeared. You know, it's it's very beautiful at the moment of of orgasm. You know, what do people say? What do they say? Oh, my God. (laughs) And they say, they say, oh God. So why are people talking theology at the moment of orgasm? <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> because, because, oh my God, because there's this revelation. You say, oh God. You say also often the name of your beloved. And you say, yes. 
Yes. Right? Yeah. Because all three of those are the same. Right? And as yes. you realize you realize that the name of your beloved is the name of God, and you're actually screaming yes, because your yes is to this unique individuation of the divine that you now in this moment before orgasm have eyes to see. Wow. Right? Like yep. wow. Like hot damn. And when people say right before orgasm, I love you, it's not because they're lying. It's because for the first time they can see. Yes. Right. I can see you with God's eyes to be a lover is to see with God's eyes. Yes. I, I also tell my students and my patients and clients that I always ask them, what's the highest form of love that would be the most representative of God? And they almost always get it. They say unconditional love. I say, good. Do you realize that that means God is a perpetual yes? Because to say no would be a, to create a limitation or a condition, which would minimize God to that condition. And right. that's why we have good and evil, because God says yes. God is that. That's gorgeously said, Paul. And, and you know, the Big Bang is this radical yes. Orgasm. To, the, to the, this explosion, this orgiastic explosion. Right with a radical yes, it's a, it's an ever echoing yes, and the Big Bang actually is actually both scientifically and in terms of the interior science is still happening. It's not a one time moment which Big Bangs. Actually, if you get the science, it's Big Banging right now. Yes, it is. It's actually cradio ex nihilo. It's being remanifest literally in every second. Yes. Wow. I could go off on a long, deep conversation on that because I study cosmology a lot and I also explore it spiritually. But um, I want to, I want to, because we, uh, we're on, we, we, we're only on item number one of, oh my God. Or so. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That's okay. It means we have 14 more podcasts to do. Oh my God. Right. So oh. the next issue I want to bring up, the only reason I want to get through these, I mean, I, I could talk to you about this stuff forever and I'm sure anyone listening that has even two brain cells holding hands is probably as excited as we are. But, um, some of the things that I have in here, I specifically put in yes. because I wanted to discuss I, them with you. I apologize. You. Sorry. No, no, don't apologize, man. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm just excited to talk to you. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm like, uh, I've got a Woody right now. So, um, a love Woody, a, a, a heart Woody. Um, Hallelujah. From our conversation together, it was clear that we agree with each other regarding the danger of belief in religion or otherwise, meaning our previous conversations yes. before the podcast. Could right. you please distinguish what a belief is and why succumbing to a given belief or belief system can limit one's capacity for conscious growth in consciousness, limit one's capacity for individ individuation, and lead to the kind of blind obedience we saw among the Nazis during World War II and we've been seeing um, among those that trust the authority figures right now since the beginning of COVID. Is, is, that, is that too much? Or That's fantastic. That's fantastic. You know, there's nothing more dangerous than belief the way you're framing it. Yes. Right? And the, the opposite of belief is knowing. And knowing, knowing means we have scripture on this. Genesis 4, verse 1, and Adam knew his wife Eve. So knowing is always carnal knowledge. Sense making is always sensual, meaning I have direct access to information, right, to meaning and value. And I, I know knowing, right, is an actual embodied experience, heart, mind, and body, where I actually experience the knowledge directly. Belief means... You're saying knowing is a verb, though, not a noun. Knowing is a story. It's an ongoing verb. Yeah, That's because right. if, see, if if knowing becomes a noun, you're in big trouble. The denominalization of knowing is when knowing becomes valid. The, when you nominalize knowing, meaning you turn knowing into a noun, it becomes a belief. Yes, because when we when 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 religion creates a noun out of God, it, it's now you're in deep trouble. Yes, brother. Another way you can say that is the God you don't believe in, the book doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> in other words, in other words, what I mean by that is we all have a belief that somebody gave us about God, that we don't have a direct experience, and that that is not a person that we trust. It might be culture, right? It might be, you know, automatic beliefs of a particular religion. It might be the surface structures of a religion. But belief means 
I don't have direct access to it. I can't feel it in my field of value. I don't know it's true through my own eyes and my own direct feeling. And it doesn't resonate in the larger value system, right, which is embodied within me, right? That's a belief. It's a frozen, and we call that idolatry. Ah, right? yes. I- idolatry is a graven image in English. It's a freezing of the image. It's the murder of imagination. Yes, that's so, so dangerously Which true. is the opposite of Imago Dei. The image of God is an infinitely unfolding image. It's an evolving image. And the human being is not just a homo sapien. The human being is Adam. And the word Adam in the original Hebrew means, Adamus. means one Adamus humus earth. Yes. He's of the earth. And the second meaning of the Hebrew is demion imagination. Ah, I didn't know that. That's beautiful. Which is, that means the human being is a homo imaginus. I think that's so great. I've read that in um, uh, Henry Corbin's work. Henry Corbin's work talks about from the perspective of Sufism. Yeah, I love Sufism too. Right. And and in the original, right, or the, the kind of the, the that, that, that particular tradition, in the, but actually the original word Adam is dimayon imagination the human being is homo imaginus and therefore idolatry the graven image is a belief which is the freezing of imagination yeah that's wow. damn good i really appreciate your description there that's i've never read that or heard it put that way and i think it's very important for people to understand but i, I have to tell you one of my favorite quotes i don't know who created the quote but it's Go, damn brother. good um, you can always tell who your God is because he hates the same people you do. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. And that's, that is the God that we create in our image instead of being an Imago Dei. Yeah. That's the engraven image. That is the engraven image. And, and really, really what life is about. And, it's, and let, me just, let me add one thing. It's not that there's not realizations that we can receive from trusted sources. But they have to be trusted sources. So, for example, you have your students, Paul, right? Yeah. So your students can appropriately rely on you to access information. You then share it with them, and they can trust you on that information until they have the capacity to experience it themselves. But because you're a great teacher, your desire, because you're a true teacher, that was obvious in the first two minutes we talked. Right, you're a true teacher, so your greatest desire is for you students to have the same experience that you've had. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I want to open the door to them having their own experience. And I always, when I teach, any of my students will tell you one of the most common words out of my mouth: "Don't believe a word I say. Go out and try it for yourself, so it becomes your knowledge and Gorgeous. your wisdom. Otherwise, all all you're doing is becoming a photocopy machine." Of Paul Check, but you don't really know if it's true or not, and that's how the whole world got fucked up. And that, and that's the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher, because a false teacher says, "I'm the authority, I have the experience, and my experience is the valid one." And by the way, that's the danger of gurus. It's why it's why I have such a you know profound anti-guru position. That's the danger of the World Economic Forum. That and and the, and gurus come in many disguises. Yes. Right. As you correctly, you know, point out. So the guru says, I know, and you don't. And there's two ways to say I know. Either my enlightenment experience is deeper than yours, so therefore listen to me, I have authority, or my data sets are better than yours, so listen to me and I have authority. The entire point of unique self is that Paul is irreducibly unique, and Paul can trust his unique self to access the field of value uniquely. So we both live in a common shared field of value, right? We have a shared grammar of value, and Paul has a contribution to make to the field of value that's irreducibly unique that I'm madly interested and excited to hear, which is why I'm so excited to talk to you now. Yeah, and and, and this this is very classically Gnostic in their approach. It wasn't an organized religion. It was a bunch of people sitting around a campfire saying, what kind of experiences you had? What and, and how did you do it? Right? Yeah. What meditation technique did you do? What ritual did you do? What practice did you do? So I could go try it. No one yeah. said, you better do it this way or you're going to burn in hell. 
That's right. And, uh, you know, there's a very, you know, Aquinas had some good days and some bad days. The great Christian medieval schoolman. Yeah, I, I know I'm who not, he is. I'm not going to talk. No, I knew you did, but I want just to mention it for people just so we, we shouldn't throw out a name. St. Right? Thomas um, Aquinas for everybody. St. Th Thomas Aquinas, right? The man. And again, he had some good days and bad days. I don't want to talk about his bad days. He had a very me. busy feather. He had a busy feather, but, but here was one of his good days. He said his favorite verse in the biblical text was a verse from Psalms, which is Tamu or Uki Tova Dunai, taste and see that God is good. Amen. And that's real. Hallelujah. Halla fucking Luya. Right. In other words, you can taste the divine. Yes. Right? And that's what love is. It's the taste of the divine. And, 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 and the divine is always licking our hearts. It, it, totally. Right. The divine is always, you know, is always arousing, right? Our pulsing, throbbing, yearning to be the most realized and stunning and beautiful versions of ourselves. Yes. And, you know, one of the majesties and the mysteries of love is that because God expresses itself through individuality. Love is the reminder of the unity that individuality is birthed from. That's right. That's right. And so that's that attraction. Like I'm attracted to the, the beauty and the magic and the mystery and the wisdom of Mark because he carries a viewpoint that enhances my life. So I get to experience more Gorgeous. God when I'm with, with you or that's with right. my wife or my kids, right? That's, that's, no, that is so gorgeous. And that's why, that's why our beloveds are so important. I mean, I'll just give you an example. My partner, Dr. Christina Kincaid, who's a, a wonderful woman. So I, I've been privileged to write this, this, you know, very beautiful, I, I think it's really beautiful, right? <laughs> Phenomenology of Eros, which is a much longer story, but I could not have written any of it. Without my interface and the depth of Christina's partnership, who, who's not only a co-author, but was actually a deep muse for my own knowing in a very deep and profound way. And in the space between us, and I was able to clarify my own knowing in a way that I never could have done myself. You know, and in the old world, you know, the master would actually kind of, in a certain sense, rob the muse and make it only the man's. And I'm really... I'm really, I'm really just wildly excited to be in devotion to the news. Yeah, well, I think that's so important. Um, yeah, because because if you're not in devotion to the muse, then the muse is diminished, and it takes the um, the muse out of the muse. Yeah, and and one of the saddest things for me, and I I can just you know just share in a kind of vulnerable sense for a second. You know, one of the saddest things to me is, and it's part of the nature of the the internet world. Right, that we live in a world in which people stop being face to face. We we live in a world in which false flags spread through the internet in a period of like three, four days, and no one knows how to climb down. And we're filled with a broken information ecology where we can't we can't trust Wikipedia, we can't trust websites. We know that there's all sorts of agendas. And so one of the tragedies for me is that we're not sitting around the fire anymore. No. And there are there are people in my life, you know, men, women, who who tragically, right, I've never been able to find at a deeper level because they froze themselves in positions, couldn't climb down. And one of the, the saddest thing for me is when we actually lose access and we forget that we loved each other. Yeah. You know, and it just, yeah. it's, heart, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, you know, you, you look at like the war going on over in uh, Russia and all that stuff and you, you see you see the the pillage and the, the the wreckage and the destruction of life, not just human life, but all life. And, you know, for me, it's like my heart says, is it really worth it? Yeah. Is it really worth it? What did you get? An oil pipeline? You got to cover up a story about a, a bunch of biological weapons labs? You, you, you got to take a few more dollars from somebody else's pocket, but look at all the dead beauty. Yeah. Look, we, look, we, look at the absolute annihilation of everything that's meaningful. You can only go to murder someone. And it doesn't matter whether you try and socially murder them or physically murder them when you actually forget the love, you, you know, do. And, you know, you, you kind of forget, Wow. This is a person we totally loved each other. We looked in each other's eyes. Maybe, maybe even we made love, right? And we're so 
quick, right? And I want to be very careful here because, of course, you know, we have to be very careful about mutuality and we've got to honor the masculine and honor the feminine in every way. That's, that's a given. And we have to recover the memory that we loved each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's heartbreaking when we can't, and it's heartbreaking when we don't sit face to face around the fire, right? And heal the wounds because we're all wounded healers. Yes. Right. We're all wounded lovers. And, 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 and there's no one. And the only thing that heals the trauma of the original wounds is to be able to find each other and look at each other again and say, Oh my God, and I'm sorry. I love you. And let's love each other more deeply. And that's what each one of us has to do. Whoever split off, we got to bring those people back into our circle of intimacy. And when we can't, we have to cry it and, and let the tears flow, but never demonize the other. Yes. And you know, the, the, the kind of a paradoxical but true thing in my observation is that the wound is necessary because it almost guarantees that we learn the meaning of empathy. And paradoxically, yeah. empathy is what heals the wound. Yeah. No. In other words, the you know the ability to heal our shattered hearts, yeah. right, is to know that we're all broken vessels, yeah. right. We're all imperfect vessels for the light, right. We, we all, have to be. <laughs> we're all holy and broken. Hallelujahs. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons that Leonard Cohen is so beautiful. Right, is that Leonard Cohen actually he owns so beautifully the holy and broken hallelujah. That's right? You know, doesn't matter which you heard, there's a blaze of light in every word, the holy and the broken hallelujah. Right? Yes. Love is right, right. Love is not a victory march, right? It's a it's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. But hallelujah means it's a beautiful word in Hebrew. Hallelujah has two meanings. It means drunken intoxication when I'm completely devastated. And hallelujah means pristine praise of angels. Wow. Both. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. And it's hallel. That's the, and then yah is yah, the breath of life that's moving through me. Yeah. Right. So we're all holy and broken hallelujahs. Yeah. Right. And when we, we split off a part of our own brokenness, we then project it onto someone and then, and then, then we demonize them. Right. And, and we've got to get to this place where we, we give up the demonized parts of ourselves. And of course, we should do our work. And of course, we should be in integrity. And of course, we should do our shadow work. That's a given. But in the end, we've got to get beyond the polarization. Yeah. Polarization is the single greatest violation of intimacy and the single greatest existential risk, which means that if everyone listening would call someone that they're polarized with and say, Let's have a conversation. It's beautiful, Paul. You know, the word for Messiah in Hebrew, Messiah, is Mashiach, which means conversation. That's great. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. That's one of the things I loved about the erotic and the holy is because you explained so many Hebrew words that, <laughs> that, that actually opened up a way of perceiving and relating that isn't available in English. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, and the truth is, I mean, brother, I'm a... I'm an atheist, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, right? You know, and I live, try and live across traditions, but my source tradition, right, is, my, is the lineage Hebrew wisdom tradition. It's where I was raised. I still practice privately. It's not my, it's not my public engagement. I, I practice more in this kind of cosmorotic humanism, the attempt to create a world grammar of value, but I practice, I'm, I'm deeply loyal and I love the lineage. And the lineage is beautiful. And by the way, anyone who can should try and find a lineage and practice in a lineage. Or, or if you practice, let's say you've taken Paul as your teacher, well, stay with him, right? And that's people, people jump, they're, they're shopping all the time. And the ability to stay with the teacher, to stay with the lineage, not as a dogma, but to go deep in, right? To have a kind of, you know, it's, it's one of the beauties of monogamy. Is you get to go, you get to go deep, and and monogamy has many different faces, right? And we need monogamous polyamory, and we need monogamous celibacy. That's a whole different conversation, but but it's about going deep. Yeah. 
Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P A L E O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. Mark, I'd love it if you can address beliefs and their correlation to the emptiness that life uh, of life that has resulted in so many people feeling anxious, depressed, and has driven the rate of suicide higher, possibly than ever in. Uh, recorded history in all categories. Yeah, I mean, that's so important. And, and let's go back, maybe if we can, to the great question of cosmoerotic humanism, which is this new story of value that we're articulating. And I want to say it if I can, because I think we're towards the end, you know, really a little bit more slowly this time, okay? With yeah. your permission. Who are you? Are you who asking are, me a question? Oh, who are you? Right. And who are you? Who are you? This is, is, <laughs> this is the, and, and I'm always asking you, who are you? And you're always asking me, who are you? Yeah. And, and, and in this, in this unfolding, let's see if we can kind of respond to this great question. Who are I wanna you? I want to answer it real quick. Go. I am the divine mirror looking at itself. I am the divine mirror looking at itself. So, so I'm going to say the same thing, okay? I'm going to say it in a little bit different words. Good. But we are, we are resonating and we are playing, you know, this is what happens when resonance happens. We're playing each other's instrument. Yeah. We're, we're feeling the music and she is dancing and the angels are ecstatic. And every word you say, and this is the thing, and, and this is how you can demonstrate, you can just feel what love is. There hasn't been a fucking millisecond in this conversation where I wasn't delighted by everything you were saying. I mean, so and, it's, it's, right? and it's lovely because I feel so expanded that I get to share with you because you're filling me up with new ways of relating, perceiving, experiencing. I mean, I'm having an experience as we're having this dialogue. I mean, I'm, I'm like, to me, this is as good as sex. I mean, I, I know that probably- Oh my God, right? No, that's gorgeous. gorgeous. No, that's this, gorgeous. Is, this to me is like emotional, mental, spiritual sex. I feel fulfilled. Right. I feel filled. I mean, I'm, you know, like a well, a artesian well bubbling out of the ground. I mean, that's life, right? That's, that's what's missing. life, right? And this is, and, and then people think that it's always got to be rivalrous conflict based on fucking win-lose metrics, which is our new story. And actually they don't understand that actually there's a higher resonance, which is not limp. It's not insipid. It's not vacuous. It's throbbing, pulsing, awake, alive, in which actually two people can come together and create a synergy of possibility. And it's the possibility of possibility that literally creates a new hole that didn't exist before yes. and a new quality of intimacy. Oh my fucking God. And that's the third. We're creating that's the, the third. third. That's, and, the, that's the third. And yes. I, I just want to throw an important point in because you use the word win lose. I tell my students, take the word lose and replace it with learn. There's not winners and losers, there's winners and learners. Gorgeous. When Gorgeous. I was a fighter, I studied my opponent carefully. And if he beat me, I studied him more. Yes. Because he had something that I didn't have. Yeah, and and we and that's this irreducible uniqueness. So let me go back with your permission, brother, as we yeah. close. Yeah, you know, and see if I can try and just gently go back to what we set up. Maybe it was a couple hours ago. The answer to the question of who are you, but this time I want to do it just kind of gently, slowly as a prayer. Who are you? 
you are an irreducibly unique expression of the love, beauty, and love desire and love intelligence of all that is that lives in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again other than through you. And as such, you have an irreducibly unique perspective and you have an irreducibly unique quality of intimacy, which fosters your unique gift which is your responsibility and joy to give in your unique circle of intimacy and influence. In other words, you can stand uniquely on the abyss of darkness and say, let there be light and reality needs your service. Anything amen. less than that realization, amen, anything less than that realization coming back to your question leaves you in emptiness. Yes, yeah. So so how does belief correlate to the uh, ab uh, the abolishment of that experience. So it, it's exactly so. Eros, the genuine experience of ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness, which is the quality of our lives, of our aliveness. Eros is living your unique self. Pseudo Eros is when you're not living your unique self and you try and cover over the emptiness with beliefs. That's so good. I remember you talking about in the erotic and the holy, and I just thought it was profound. Yeah. And you talked about the space between us. Yes. And you, I think, was it was it Shekinah? Is that the right word? The space between the cherubs is the space where the Shekinah, the, 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 the she or Eros dwells. Yes. She dwells in the space between us. Yes. Yeah. And see, the problem with a lot of beliefs is they separate you from everybody else. You know, that's the ethnocentric uh, problem. And that's also the um, literal translation problem of scripture. It, it, it becomes legalized. So you're right or wrong. It's not. What if there's yeah. something greater that we're both missing? Yeah. You know, and I think because belief, belief systems are closed, you know, the analogy I give is how much Buddhism, Taoism, and Shinto can you throw into the Bible before you don't know what Christianity is anymore, <laughs> right? So the problem yeah. with a belief system is it's closed and it conceals you. And then the only people that are your friends are the people that reverberate the same message. So you don't grow, you just start putrefying right. in it, you know? And I, you know, one of the things I love about your description of Eros is, is that it's infinitely open-ended. It's perpetually looking for new opportunities for novelty, novelty, creation, connection, communication, and authentic expression. Knowing is infinite because knowing is when I step into the infinity of intimacy and I know ever more because knowing is the progressive deepening of intimacies, belief destroys intimacy. Belief blocks eros. Belief is a form of pseudo eros, which in the end leaves me in the emptiness in the same way pornography is not making love. Yeah, it's fake food, you know? Belief belief is 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 the pornographic intellectualization of yeah. spirit. Belief yeah. is puffed wheat. Yeah, puffed wheat it is. So let's go for knowing. Let's know each other. Let's know each other. Oh my God. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it's it, it's a real diversion from the standard English concept of knowing. To know something like I know how to tie my shoe, so I don't think about it. Mm. You know, but you're using knowing as um, knowing is carnal. Knowing is carnal. It's always carnal knowledge, meaning I know it because it's in me because I can breathe it. See, the reason tying my shoe is knowing because it, it actually is a approximation of deeper knowing it's known because it's in my body because i do it automatically because i know it directly i have direct access to tying my shoe it's not a belief so imagine that that's the same knowing i have of spirit right it's it's literally inside of me it breathes in me you know there's a very beautiful text from the book of job chapter 19 through my body i vision god and i want to know i want to know god with the same intimacy, right? That I tie yes. my shoe. The only difference is I want to actually be tying my shoe more artfully. I want to be knowing ever more deeply. So tying my shoe is the knowing of something which doesn't grow. It doesn't evolve. Right. To, when I know Paul, I mean, actually in the, in, our, in the encounters we've had, each time we've encountered, we know each other more, literally. 
Yeah, and it's, it's amazing because that process, that's why I said the day you think you know your wife is the day your relationship starts to rot. Right. You right. know, this brings up a, a, a thought I, I wanted to share with you, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but for the listeners, one time in an interview that I saw with Carl Jung, um, it, you know, it was one of the BBC interviews or something, the, the interviewer said to him, do you believe God is real? He said, no. And the interview looked a bit shocked. And he said, I don't believe God is real. I know God is real. That's right. That's right. I mean, maybe, you know, this is maybe a, a beautiful place, you know, as we finish, there's a very beautiful, you know, story, which is, you know, you know, just really captures it. It's about a, a contest, actually, that actually took place in England, in which people were reading the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a competition, you know, formal England competition, Big Holland. You know, this very, very beautiful English actor, you know, is about to, he just finished reading. He's about to be awarded the prize. And this old man, you know, comes in the back and he says, I, I want to, I want to recite it. And everyone says, no, 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 we're done. Like, who are you? You're not registered. But, you know, somehow they let, he gets his way up to the stage and he just starts reading. And the place just gets completely quiet, just completely quiet. He reads, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And it gets, the silence gets deeper and deeper until he finishes and the place can't move. And it's like silent for an entire minute. Then the entire place just gets up in this resounding, deafening applause. And of course they give him, you know, the award. And so this actor, this English diction actor, who's actually a good guy, he says, I don't understand. I'm like, I know everything about acting. He says, he says, like, I did it the best I could. What do you know that I don't know? <laughs> and the old, the old man says, I know the shepherd. Oh, yeah. I know the shepherd. You know what right? I thought the old man was going to say? I'm not acting. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Right. I know the shepherd. I know yes. the shepherd. I know the shepherd. Yeah. And oh my God. And knowing you, Paul, is knowing a new quality of the shepherd. So I'm madly Yeah, you too. To yeah. Here. And you know, uh, thank you for helping me learn how to be a better shepherd for myself oh my and for everybody that I can touch. Because uh, what an you know, honor! What an I, honor. I was writing notes as fast as I could write. I probably wore out multiple pens through the erotic and the holy. And um, you know, I'm delighted. I went through it in the gym, and then the second time we went on vacation, we rented a, a nice thirty-something foot motorhome and drove up to see my son and my grandson and his family up in Portland. Wow. And that's all I did the whole time. Penny likes to drive because she gets car sick if she's not driving. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I always read and um, I, I I was just enjoying the erotic and the holy as we drove all the way from San Diego to Portland and back home. And, and, and I just, you know, that book is so deep. You can't go through it once and put it down unless you're deceiving yourself because almost Every sentence you make to me is a beautiful contemplative meditation, and I would have to Thank pause you. and sit in it Thank and you. and really let it permeate me and and experience it you know you to me when you are in the presence of authentic wisdom it, it you you have to um let it soak in if you just rush through it then it just becomes ideas, you know? And, and so, you know, I, I want to thank you for, for many hours of, of honest thank contemplative you. meditation where I allowed your concepts to permeate me and take me to the place that you were guiding all the listeners so that I could be in resonance with your message and the experience that it brought. And I, I never realized that the Hebrew conception and perception was so different than others that I had experienced. And, and most of my exposure to Hebrew, anything comes from most of the things like the Talmud and the Jewish books, but I don't have the depth of understanding. So I'm always interpreting them through my own yeah. California Western <sighs> lexicon, which, you know, obviously when I listened to your book, I went, wow, you know, I, if I went back and read any of the Jewish texts now, I would actually understand them at a completely different level. Paul, I'm deeply honored. It's my great, great honor and my great joy to be with you. Yeah, well, you too. And thank you very much. And, and uh, you know, for the listeners, Mark's agreed to 
uh, continue with another podcast. We're only on question three out of about 15 that I outlined. So that means we have um, f- what three, what three, uh, <laughs> what, three times five is 50. We got four more podcasts to do to four get more, through our list. Four more to go. Well, but, I'm in. I'm but in either all the way, way you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it and, and we can dialogue and see what's going on in the world and adjust yes. things to make it most permanent. But, you know, I, I want to thank you, Mark, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners do, if not all of them, because I think you may have done the best job as a physician to get your finger on the pulse and really point out what's really behind what's going on in the world right now. I mean, that that first hour, hour and a half where we're talking about that, it really boils down to to a breakdown of intimacy and and yes. and love and i i think i've talked to many very intelligent people about this and you get all sorts of different answers a lot of them very good and a lot of them very interesting but you penetrated it you you gave it an eros um treatment and 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 yeah. and, and, and and you brought in the penetration that brought a novel awareness for me because of this day, I'm going to look out at the world, and instead of looking and seeing what's so fucked up, I'm going to ask myself, where can I bring more love and intimacy into the world instead of just coming up with logical solutions? Gorgeous. You, you are, Paul, you are gorgeousness, and, and I'm, I'm deeply moved by your words and honored by them, and I, you've been an absolute delight. And let's let's create and let's love it open together, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being willing. I know you're not doing a lot of podcasts, so it's a real honor to have you, you, you know, devote yeah. the time you have to me and my audience. And I, I know they're all uh, grateful. And I also know all the sponsors of, of my podcast. I mean, I know the people and they're amazing right. people. And I will encourage each of them to listen to this podcast. Uh, and I only do that when I really think that it's worth their time, because I think people that have access to lots of people need to have the experience that we've just shared, because I think if we all start looking at this world situation as a love deficit and know that before we can come up with the right technologies, the right solutions, the right legal moves or whatever, if we don't connect at the heart, then we're all ultimately just going to keep polarizing each other. You know, I, I think that if we can find each other, then in that process, the solutions I think will emerge just like when couples are having a hard time, but then they have good sex. All of a sudden the hard yeah. time doesn't seem so important anymore. The love becomes the bonding yeah. force, you know? Yeah. I mean, when, when we have a genuine experience of Eros, we stop asking the meaning of life, not because we've answered the question, but because the question falls away. Yes. Yeah. You, you become wow. immersed in it. It's self-evident, right? It becomes, there's a term in the lineage, Lishma. I begin to act for its own sake. Yes. It's self, yes. It's self-evidently good. And you know what I love? Without you knowing it or contributing to it, I titled the show today love question mark and oh my god isn't that just how it began and how it ended hot damn i love you brother yeah thank you i love you too and so thank you i love all of you guys for listening thank all of you i thank all of you for participating in everything that you've heard and embodying it making it your own and seeing that we really just have a deficit of connection out there and um you know I, I would also say that it's very important right now to really not only open your hearts but learn to say no to beliefs behaviors mandates and dictates that enhance the disconnection we, we've got to say no to disconnection we we've got to be with our friends. We've got to be with our family. And I don't care what the virus is. If it's going to kill us, let's die together, not isolated rooms and masks and suits. I want to die with the people I love. I don't want to die isolated from them, you know? Mm. And so, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm speaking literally and metaphorically, uh, no matter what shit they come out of a lab with next to try to scare everybody into the new world order. I say, let's sing and dance together with whatever pimples, bumps and bruises and cuts and scrapes and, and pustules that we get from their tricks because those things aren't nearly as powerful against us when we're harmonized together. And, and you know, love is the ultimate medicine. There's just no question about it. Love and sleep. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So thanks everybody. And thank you to all my sponsors and thanks for anything you guys buy from the sponsors. It supports the podcast so I can do the work to write up podcasts, find people, do the research and bring you amazing divine beings like Mark Gaffney. And I, Look forward to sharing something with all of you real soon. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. Mark Gaffney. You can find Mark online at markgaffney.com. That's M-A-R-C-G-A-F-N-I.com. Or connect with him on Instagram and Twitter at Mark Gaffney, on Facebook and LinkedIn at Dr. Mark Gaffney, or watch more on his YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mark Gaffney. Mark offers a free weekly broadcast, plus listeners can download chapters one to four of the award-winning Your Unique Self book by going to onemountainmanypaths.org forward slash your dash unique dash self. That's one mountain many paths.org forward slash your dash unique dash self. His books, Your Unique Self, The Radical Path to Personal Enlightenment, and A Return to Eros, The Radical Experience of Being Fully Alive, are available on Amazon and at all good bookstores. And his mini course, Your Unique Self, can be taken free at unique self institute.com forward slash the dash unique dash self dash mini dash course. That's unique self institute.com forward slash the dash unique dash self dash mini dash course. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.